Hi everyone, my name is Dan Scott and this is a small extract from my larger course called Figma Essentials. Uh, loads of value here, but if you do want to go further with Figma, check out my Figma Essentials course. There'll be a link in the description. All right, let's get going. Hi everyone, my name is Dan Scott, and welcome to Figma Essentials. Together, you and me are gonna learn everything we need to know to get started as a UX designer in Figma. We'll use this uh, UI UX design tool to create beautiful interfaces. We'll also create some engaging prototypes, and also we will look at some of the real world expectations of you as a new UX designer. Now this course is aimed at people who are new to design, new to user experience design, even if you're not even that entirely sure what UX design actually is, don't worry, we're gonna start right at the beginning and work our way through step by step. First, we'll describe the brief and how to work with a UX persona. Then you'll learn how to create really simple wireframes. From there, we learn how to implement colors and images properly in your high fidelity mockups. You'll learn the do's and don'ts for choosing fonts for web and mobile apps. You'll learn how to create icons, buttons, and all sorts of UI components. You'll learn all the scary terms like component sets, constraints, and multi-dimensional variants. <laughs> They're all very easy once you get to know them. We'll also make our lives easier by using free UI kits and plugins for Figma to speed up our workflow. We'll build a simple style guide ready for colleague or client handoff. You'll know how to make both simple and advanced micro interactions, page transitions and animations. Before the end of this course, you'll have fully interactive prototypes ready for user testing, all the way through to collaborating with other team members and exporting the right files ready for handoff to your developer or software engineer. You've got assignments that I set throughout the course uh, so that you can practice and develop your skills, plus you'll have something unique for your portfolio at the end. All right, it is time to upgrade yourself and go from Figma Zero to Figma Hero. So sign up and I'll see you in class. Now, the shirt. This shirt made a whole lot of sense. It makes a whole lot of sense later on when you know Figma a little bit more. But at the moment, I've realized it's come across a little bit, probably just creepy. But it's made now and <laughs> we're gonna have to live with it. So sign up to the course. I'll see you in there. Hello, you made it in, congratulations. Uh, welcome to the course. Uh, first things first is you need to download the exercise files. There is, uh, there'll be a link on this page here, download those. Uh, in those exercise files will be the files we we'll use for the course, but also there'll be a shortcut sheet. Okay, we won't go too deep into mad shortcuts here, but um, there are just some super useful ones that you'll need to know by the end of the course. So print that sheet out and you can circle the ones you really like. And um, also you need a version of Figma, okay? So Figma, go to figma.com, either use the browser version, so sign up, use the browser version, or download the desktop version. There is absolutely nothing, you know, no difference between the two. I'm gonna use the desktop version um, because I'm old and I like things being on my desktop for no good reason, because they're exactly the same. So it doesn't matter. You'll also know from only watching a tiny bit of my video that I talk fast. I've had a lot of coffee, it's early, I, talk, I do slow down, okay? But if you find that I speak very fast, okay, um, or maybe English isn't your first language and you find my accent a little tough, um, there will be, on all the videos, there's like a little cog, where is it, down there, and you'll be able to click that and slow me down to a slower version. I sound a little weird, but it's, it, it might make it easier for you. Um, and that is it, ah, free version, paid version. Um, we are going to use the free version for most of the course, mainly because it's amazing. Like it's amazing what Figma have decided to allow it to be free versus what is paid. Towards the end of the course, I will show you why you might want to jump up to the paid, but you can get quite far as like a professional designer using the 
uh, free version, but I will show you the perks for paid later on. Also, uh, Figma is always updating, which is amazing to me as a designer. It means new features come out all the time. They rejig things to make it simpler and easier and include more advanced features. It is really painful for me as an instructor uh, because Basically, I, I know this. As soon as I finish recording this course, they're gonna go and shuffle some bits around. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, if it's fundamental stuff, I'll re-record the videos. If it's just small stuff, just take a look. Uh, often it could be just a name change. It's in the same place, does the same job, but maybe they've called it something else or clarified it a little bit. Uh, also check the comments below. Uh, either I'll leave a comment if it's just a small change or other students will as well. So just keep an eye out on that. Yay for lots of updates. Boo for lots of updates. Um, all right, let's get on to the next video. All right, let's talk about what Figma is for and what it's not for. Um, it is amazing at rapid prototyping of things like websites and apps. Okay, it does do other things, which we'll cover a little bit, um, but it is the main tool of a UX or UI designer, okay? And their role in the creation of either wireframes, which we'll do in this course, okay? Of really quick kind of look and feel for an app or a website through to kind of like really, like it looks exactly like a website, high fidelity mockups of this website with interactivity as well, okay? And this kind of leads me to where it doesn't do you can make something that looks very like a website, enough so that you can go out to testing. And that's probably the, the, the best bit about Figma and UX in general, is that we'll create something and then we'll actually be able to get it in the hands of the client, uh, the intended audience, okay, our customers, and they can, it's not gonna be complete, okay, but they'll be able to use it enough that we can make some observations and actually test some theories about what, you know, they think, um, that, you know, what the users want. And if things need to be changes, we can change them really quickly in Figma and then get them back to them, like why they're sitting there. Okay, so it is about rapid prototyping, quick, you know, uh, changes and get to a point where you're like satisfied with the website or the app and you're like, this has gone through a bit of user testing, client's happy with it. Now, this is where Figma doesn't do anything else, okay? It is just the prototype. Um, it's not gonna code the website for you or the app, okay? It hands over little pieces to the developer to use, okay? CSS and SVGs and graphics and stuff, um, but not a lot that the developer can use. They'll end up kind of starting from scratch using your mockups, okay? And they'll use a lot of things like spacing and they'll make it look like your app, okay? But um, that's what Figma doesn't do, okay? It doesn't do the coding side. So what you do is you get it kind of signed off with the client and then you either work with a developer, if you're a developer yourself, you start coding it, um, or you might start, like if you're, you might get into HTML and CSS, I got a course on that. If you wanna start doing your own stuff, okay? Or you might be using something like WordPress or Webflow, okay? I've got courses on the horizon for both of those two, or Wix or something more drag and drop, okay? You then have to build it based on your Figma mockup that you've, it's a lot faster to do, then go and build it either in one of those tools or code it. So that's what it is, rapid prototyping, okay? And what it's not is you're not gonna have a complete site at the end. That's a question I get asked a lot, so. Next video. Actually, I forgot one thing. <laughs> don't go away, edit it, don't cut it. Uh, what else is it getting used for? Figma is getting used a lot for like just regular or graphic design mainly in the digital space, so like social media campaigns. There's some amazing things you'll, you'll see it as you go through the course. You'll be like, this would be really handy for doing Instagram story posts or carousels or a bunch of different sizes for ads. It is getting really good at that. It doesn't do a very good print stuff. You can put a normal page into it. You can say A4 or US letter. Okay, so our people are using it as an alternative for something like maybe Illustrator and a bit of Photoshop. Photoshop's still required, but um, You'll see it. it's made for designing websites and um, apps, but people are using it for all sorts of other stuff now. It's coming, not a general design tool, but know that you will find some people using it a lot more for things that it's not meant to, but it does it just perfect. All right, so that's what it is. That's what it isn't. Now, this is the end. Cut. All right, let's talk about what UI versus UX is. If you already know, you're allowed to skip this video, it's okay. 
And this is not gonna be a very like detailed, just give you an understanding of like the differences between the two, because it comes up a lot. And um, so UI design, the simple way, this is all very simple. Okay, the UI, user interface versus UX, the user experience. Okay, the UI is the way something looks and the UX is how it works, how somebody uses it. Okay, so often the way it looks, how it's used. And um, now in terms of being a UI designer, like UI designer is in charge, like up until UX became part of my life and a lot of us, it's kind of a newish. And um, I did a lot of UI design. I designed a website and it was based a lot on my intuition, like, oh, buttons should be this big and it should be over here. And traditionally things go over here in the nav. Okay, so there was a lot of that and I'd give it to the client, they'd like it, great. Okay, but there was a big element missing, the UX, okay? There was very little testing, okay? I had a, I had an idea of what would work, okay? But it was totally an idea. It was like a hypothesis of how it should work. And the UX part of being a UX designer is the taking that kind of UI, okay, that layout and getting it in the hands of clients and testing it, okay? That part of it turns you from just a UI designer into you know, the beginnings of a UX designer is getting it out there and actually testing that. Did it work? Did it do exactly, you know, what I hoped it would do? You know, um, is the client, when they click this button, did they go where they expected or were they surprised? Okay, is the language like, let's say a UI designer designs the button, okay? And the rounded corners and the beautiful gradient, okay? Or the, and the text in the middle, okay? The UX designer says, that's great. Let's go and test that and says, you know, is it big enough? Can they click on it? Is there enough contrast? Is it accessible for people maybe that have, uh, that are visually impaired, okay? It is, you know, is the hierarchy of buttons. Is this one too big? Because it feels like it should be doing something else. There's a lot of that side of thing is the UX. Now, in all honesty, this course is based uh, mostly around UI design because we're learning Figma. Figma is the creation of these things. The testing side of stuff, I'll give you a, um, you know, some ex some insights as we go along about what I would do at different testing phases, okay? But it is broader than what can be covered in this course, okay? But we'll do UI with a little bit of UX, okay? But Figma, basically, is we're learning software. That's why you signed up, probably. Okay, so it doesn't make you instantly a UX designer. The UX part is the, you know, taking it further than just moving pixels around on the screen is like giving it out there and getting it tested and changing things and testing things. That's UX. My little example that I'm kind of running through at the moment, example, it's a, yeah, my bank updated its website and its app and it looks beautiful. The UI, amazing. The UX is terrible. Okay, I'm sure it went through some testing. I imagine it went through lots of testing. Not right at the end though, because there's just, it's just simple things. Like, um, let's say that I'm typing in my password, typey, typey, type, hit enter, enter, enter. Nope, you gotta get the mouse and click the enter button. So I'm like, why, you know, there's a, in code, it's not hard, that kind of, I can't remember what it's called. When you get to the end, it will know that when you press enter, you mean this button here. So that's just one thing. Okay, another thing you go into like updating a, I went to update a person in my standing orders, like a direct debit or I'm not sure what you call it in your country, but a regular payment that I'm making. Okay, so I went to find how to edit it. I'm like, huh, I have to delete it because I couldn't find anywhere. You know, and I'm tech savvy. I know how to use computers. I'm like, couldn't find it. So I was like, oh, well, maybe I have to delete it. And I've been doing this a few times. I was like, I'm going to email them. Um, and they're like, oh, you just got to click the name of the person to edit it. I'm like, huh. Oh, that seems simple. Go in, have a look. And you do, if you click the name of the person, it does go in to edit it, but it's missing a couple of things. Any sort of indication that that's possible. Underline, arrow, big sign, tooltip. Nope. Um, and the other weird thing about it is, you know when your mouse, your, your mouse is kind of moving along and when you go over something clickable, it turns into the little hand? It doesn't do that. You just click it with the arrow and hopefully it's like start clicking everything. That must be hard to turn that thing off. <laughs> Somehow it's off. There is a million and one of those little things. Ah, it's just come out. But I do have a problem with it. Anyway, I'm burbling. And red, why do red again? This feels very ominous. Um, my little colored light, I just bought the colored light. You're gonna see it all the way through this course until I get sick of it. Um, but yeah, that's my UX story at the moment. You'll have them as well. And that's the kind of thing, if you're new to UX, is keep those ideas open. Like. They're terrible and they're a pain in the butt, 
but it's kind of language and stuff that you're gathering as a designer so that when you're working, you can avoid some of those things, or at least, it, you know, when it comes back from testing, you're not surprised. You're like, oh yeah, that thing that I hate as well is in this thing. So UI UX, that's my explanation for the moment. All right, next video. Hi everyone, in this video we're gonna look at what we're making. Okay, we are gonna start making some wireframes initially. Okay, then we will make some high fidelity versions. Okay, that look a little prettier. That one's actually pretty messy. Let's look at this one here. Okay, see the screens down the bottom. Okay, so we're gonna work on these. We're gonna build styles, components, all sorts of goodness. Let's have a look at one of the mock-up versions. So yeah, it's uh, this is gonna be what we make. We'll design it, we'll add some interactivity, we'll make a form, people can purchase stuff. It's gonna follow our brief, both our persona and our task flow. So let's talk about what those things are. So we are going to focus on the software of Figma, but I will throw in some kind of general UX design advice for people that are quite new. So what are we working to? We've got a company called Scott Headphones that wants us to design a few pages. Uh, for this task flow. The task flow here in this case is they want a home page that uh, goes to some features about the product. Those um, pro That product can be added to a checkout and then once the credit card details are filled in, confirmation. So that's what they've asked us to build. They've given us a persona. So let's quickly talk about what a persona is. So this is just a bare bones kind of persona. They can run to one whole page, two whole pages, um, but this is gonna be enough for this particular course. And what is it for? So I'll read it out, you can read, but um, our ideal customer is a woman named Sarah. Sarah's in her 20s, she has a bachelor's degree, she works for herself, she's married with kids, uh, and she lives in Ireland. She has never bought anything like this before, and uh, some of her concerns is that she is very eco-environmentally and waste conscious. So why do we have a persona? It's to allow us to be specific, okay? Not specifically to Sarah herself. Sarah is representative of a, a type of person, okay? A group of people that are gonna be using this website. And it helps me distance myself. Otherwise, I end up building uh, things that I would like. Okay, based on my own history and the way I know the product. So this gives me boundaries, otherwise you end up either designing for yourself or for everybody, and then nobody wins. Okay, because you end up with this generic thing that doesn't actually work for the target audience. So our persona helps us define that audience. It also helps when you are dealing with the client or stakeholders as well, because you can detach your own kind of personal preferences, like I want brush script, they want Times New Roman, but what does Sarah want? Like, we need to have empathy for her and her situation and her experience with the product. And it does, it helps with those conversations to be separated from what Dan likes as the designer, what the client likes as her or himself. And let's talk about what's right for Sarah. And that's through to like uh, color, fonts, uh, language, types of imagery, organization of information, like what features should be shown earlier based on you know some of the preferences she has and some of the knowledge of the product. Now this is just like a super quick overview of Persona. It's a, we're kind of learning UX design here in Figma. Okay, a UX researcher, okay, will spend a lot more time and potentially produce uh, you know a lot more documentation around and understand Sarah a lot more than kind of what we've done here. So I guess I, that's a kind of a broad overview if you're new. And if you are new, my advice to you is to spend some time, okay, now or after this course, researching personas, what they're for, okay, so to get a better understanding and just know that this is a very simplified version of it, but good for what we need for this course. Now, task flow, if you haven't heard of it before, okay, task flow here, we've been given, uh, instead of designing all of the mobile website, we've been asked to design a certain kind of important critical feature. Okay, so we have to design this home page, shows the products uh, or the product features, a checkout page and a confirmation page. So this is a nice simple task flow. They can be a bit more complicated. Okay, they can be less complicated. It might be like, a, you know, task flows could include things like how, you know, how does a person cancel this product? What is the process there? 
Okay, you might be designing the cancellation process. Maybe it's the sign up process. Maybe it's how to change your password, how to download or upload a document. It might be a specific thing that needs to be done on your particular app or website. So let's consider a task flow. And also actually let's throw in this other term, kind of his buddy. So task flow versus user flows comes up quite a bit. Okay, and um, there's this great article here by Erica Hirano. I'll put a link on the screen here, but um, after this uh, video or after this course, do spend a bit more time understanding these, but I'll give you the brief rundown. So basically task flow, let's have a look. They've got the pancake task flow. So I'm gonna look at this finding a recipe version. Okay, very simple, kind of like what we're doing in our course. Homepage, search for pancakes, search results, find the super banana pancake recipe. Simple task flow, it's step by step, it's sequential, kind of linear, whereas a task flow, okay, is a lot more complex. Let's have a look at this one. So this one here, can you see, um, we end up with, a, it's the same kind of process. So you start at the home page and you end up with super banana pancake, but there's a lot more uh, ways of getting there. There's more than one option, which we know is always the case. Like this option is like the big one here. The first one is, are they gonna use the search bar at all? Thou task flow up above, okay, said assumed using the uh, search option, but there is going to be, your persona might not be a search bar kind of person. Okay, and they're gonna go this way. So no, they're not gonna use the search bar. So then we're gonna have to build out and mock up okay, uh, the browsing the categories. And there's a breakfast category. And then there's a breakfast page. Okay, and they're finding pancakes within that breakfast page. And then they click on the recipe that they want. Okay, and they've ended up back at the same place but it's a different way of getting there, okay? There is, you can see the key up here, there's decision nodes, okay? The different shapes, okay, for different actions, okay? These are our pages, these are interactions between the user and the interface, and these are decisions, and I've got the start and stop there. So user flows are more complex, show different options. So you've got to make sure that you are designing for the right thing. If you're designing a user flow, it's gonna have more to it, in a bigger job, whereas a task flow can be quite a simple boundaried option. Now you will have task flows within this user flow. Can you still see our homepage uh, search results um, banana is still there, okay? It's just kind of baked into this more complex or different pathway that the user might follow. A user flow will help you find more things like any sort of dead ends or where people get stuck in a loop or don't know where to go anymore. Okay, so yeah, that's the brief uh, user flow versus task flow. Another thing to mention is that we've been asked to design a mobile uh, website version of this, not an app. So an app, you just have, you know, the one mobile size screen, okay? Because it's a mobile website, it means you're probably gonna have to design out not only the mobile version, but maybe a tablet and a desktop version as well. So that can often catch you out when you're new and you're like, if somebody asks you to design a desktop website, you're gonna have to, the developer's gonna wanna see what, you know, how the site breaks down to a mobile version or up into a desktop version. So take that into account. But our focus here is the mobile version. And lastly, this is a pretty bare bones in terms of, you know, we've got a persona, we've got a company name and a task flow, but um, often a brief can be a lot bigger than this, okay? Like designing a whole website. And sometimes you can get uh, a lot of details around it. Okay, so for me as a designer, what would be hard with this particular one is how much do I know about Scott Headphones? Not very little at this stage, okay? I would like to see, I'd like to talk to them or have my product manager talk to them or, you know, whoever's in charge talk to them about, you know, what they're about, you know, um, what are their values? What is their mission to help me uh, kind of help with this persona to kind of build another level on there. And sometimes you won't get that information, okay? And sometimes you will. If you get given something from a bigger company, they're probably gonna have values and mission statement, okay? So you can go off and find that and add that to your kind of tool set when you are designing this thing to have better conversations with the stakeholders when you are referencing what you're doing versus where they're going as a company. Equally, you're gonna get jobs where there is no values and there is no mission and they haven't really thought about it and you're gonna to have to you know, do your best with what you've got and as you get more experienced, push back for those types of things. It's probably conversations that I wanna have more and more, the more experienced I get, like uh, not just a persona, but like, why are we doing this? Where is the direction we're going, okay? Uh, you know, Who am I helping? Why are we helping? Uh, to really influence my design work. But anyway, uh, this is a good starting point for this course. Um, let's, let's move on.
Hi everyone, it is time for your very first bit of home. We're not gonna call it homework. We're gonna call it uh, class projects. They're here to, you can ignore them, you totally can, but it will really help you solidify what we've learned. And my goal is so that you can create something through this course that is unique from the course material that I'm making, okay? That is great for your own portfolio. Okay, so um, the first one is to create your own brief. So we saw in the last video that I made a brief, where is my brief? So that's my one. What I want you to do is go to this website that uh, we've just created here. Okay, so randomprojectgenerator.com. Okay, I want you to enter your last name uh, or your pet's name, okay, or a friend's last name, somebody's name, <laughs> okay, okay, for the company, and enter your location. Rio was where I was born. You can put in, uh, you know, Ireland as a country. If you're in a big country, put in your state or town, whatever it is. Okay, so and then click generate my project. Okay, make sure you're on the UX UI um, tab there and click generate my project, and you should get something unique for you. Okay, so I've got shadow surfboards. Ooh, it's kind of cool. Okay, and so this gets randomly generated. Do not hit retry. The red button is red. I just want you to pick the first one you got, even if you're like, hmm, okay. Some of the more tricky objects, okay, and tricky uh, personas is one of those things that will really help build you as a designer. Okay, <laughs> don't hit it. Um, and yeah, have a little read through. So um, you're gonna get something unique and it's gonna be unique in some ways, as in the company name and the product, but the actual thing we'll build together will all be the same kind of structure. So we'll follow the same task flow. You're gonna use homepage, product features, checkout and confirmation, whatever the product is. And it just means though that when you do start following along, okay, we're still gonna draw a button and it's still gonna say learn more, but you're gonna be using colors that are good for your persona. Um, when I say bring in an image, instead of bring in headphones, you're gonna bring in surfboards or whatever your product is, okay? You're still gonna have you know, an image in a circle. So they're gonna have the same uh, structure, but at least at the end, you're gonna have something kind of unique for your own portfolio. Plus it's gonna get you thinking about your own persona uh, and how you might kind of design for them. Get the idea? So follow along in this course, but using your own company name, okay, which I'll get you to make a little bit later on and picking your own images and colors for that brand. So once you've done it, you either take a screenshot of it or copy it to clipboard or download it as a PNG and just store it away on your computer or your phone ready for later in the course. We're gonna put them together on a kind of a brief and task flow page later on. Another thing I want you to do, so we've got our kind of company name and persona. So you've downloaded it, copied it to clipboard, something. You've got it somewhere stored away. And um, let's bring in the task flow as well because we're all using the same one. So it's gonna allow me to show you something strange, weird. I don't know. Interesting for Figma. Figma really wants everything to be in the cloud online. Okay, so go back to your kind of home page, or if you're on a PC, go to the little Figma icon and go to the one that says, it's about here, it says go to files or something similar. Be on your drafts. And if you want to import a Figma file, okay, rather than it being shared with you, do you see this little icon up here? It's import. Look for that icon. It has moved around in the past. Give it a click. Okay, and in your exercise files is one called taskflow.fig. Okay, load that in there and we'll use that later on as well. You can open it, have a look. Okay, basically it is just our task flow. Okay, and we'll copy and paste that and combine it later in the course. But you've got your task flow, you have got your own brief, or at least persona and name, and you're ready to carry on. So go do that as homework and I will see you in the next video. Hi everyone, in this video, we're gonna talk about the difference between wireframes and high fidelity. Okay, well it's pretty easy, you can see. Wireframes are pretty budget and high fidelity mockups look really nice. And um, they'll call them hi-fi, lo-fi, okay? Generally though, they'll call them wireframes. And hi-fi is high fidelity. Okay, this one's gonna be really quick and easy to make and test. Okay, and do not try and skip, if you're new to UX, skipping the wireframe, um, section of your kind of design process at your peril. Um, you can probably knock up a wireframe in a few minutes. Uh, always high fidelity, you can end up kind of like playing with the tracking and leading for hours and hours, and you will not get a better, you know, test out of your potential kind of audience. You know, we've been assigned a task flow, 
we can really easily create a wireframe and test that task flow even on the app. I'll show you how to do that, like on a phone or on a website. Super quick, super easy, and no distracting, uh, like, oh, is that the right image? Is that the right font? I'm not sure about the colors. You're talking about the task flow, okay? Like the actual mechanics of how this is built underneath, and we can test it quickly with wireframes. Wireframes don't have to look like this. That's my wireframe. Uh, another wireframe that I downloaded, a lot prettier. Buttons have got color in them, ooh, okay? Pick one color only, gray and a color if you want, or stick to gray. You wanna take away the design elements here and you spending time doing it, or at least uh, you know the client going, oh, I don't like pink, or this blue's not the right blue. You wanna take all of that out of the equation when you're designing wireframes. Keep it simple, pick a boring font and a boring color. Another wireframe, slightly nicer. Yeah, somebody spent some time on lots of kind of headings and stuff. And yeah, you can, there's no reason you can't take your, um, you know, wireframes further than what we do in this course. A really simple one that's kind of removed all the text. Okay, another sketchy one. Ooh, kind of sketchy. I think that's too close to Comic Sans for me. <laughs> but I like the sketchy lines around the outside. Uh, so they're all live, lo fi wireframes. Okay, hi fi. It's in the same document. Okay, this one looks a lot prettier though. Okay, this one here, another hi-fi. A lot more time and effort going into this one. But for testing, you only need the basics, so that's why we're doing wireframes. And you have to do it, because that's the beginning of the course. We're gonna learn lots about how to use Figma, building the wireframes before we start building our super beautiful things a little bit later in the course. All right, let's actually get started with Figma and do something. Okay, so let's make our first uh, design file. So it can be a little confusing for this first screen. Yours is gonna look different from mine because they change this quite often. If you have nothing like mine, you might go up to the top left hand here and click on the little drop down. If you're somewhere else, you might have to click on the home button first and then this little drop down. And what you're looking to do is to click on your name. Mine will be a bit blurry here because it's got my email addresses as well, but click on your name, not community, click here, and you should get to something resembling my screen. What we wanna do is a new design file. That only appeared the other day. And so what I've normally done in the past is I go to, we're gonna create a drafts, okay? And it's this little plus, it's kinda of next to it. Okay, so either way, we're making a new design file. Okay, and there we go. All right, if you're brand new, I've kind of reset my Figma so all these little pop-ups. You can show stuff, I'm here to show you. So I'm gonna cancel that. You end up with this big nothing screen. So we've got our design file, okay? Now we need to introduce frames. Frames are these guys here. It's this uh, little icon here, third one in, click on it. Okay, and you can draw out any size frame. Think of a frame as a page, okay? So if we're drawing an app, we're gonna draw something kind of like, oh, go back to this tool here, draw out something that looks like an app. You can have multiple frames, okay? All sorts of different sizes. Desktop one, tablet one. So frames have many uses, okay? But at this early stage of the course, think of them as a page or an artboard if you're from Adobe land. And what we need to do is delete them because those are random sizes. Click anywhere in the inside of them, hit delete. Click them, delete them. All right, so go to your frame tool and actually let's be a little bit more uh, specific with our sizes. Okay, over here you'll have some pre-made sizes. Okay, you are gonna be in the future. So you might be at iPhone 52. Okay, I'm gonna use iPhone 8. It's a nice generic size for both uh, Android and Apple. Some of these big ones get a bit big and strange sized. Now the goal here is to pick a size that is generic. Okay, we're not gonna design every different iPhone in different size. We're gonna design something close enough to the general purpose phone and our developer will build something that is a bit more responsive and we'll, we'll adjust for the kind of small changes in the different pixels. So pick a phone size that is quite generic. It's easiest just to Google like most common phone size, um, you know, and you will get something or most common desktop size, okay? And you will get something in here and pick it. If you're designing a watch, if you're doing kind of just regular old, old school paper, the wood stuff, Okay, there's all sorts of things in here. So yours will be different. Now, I'm gonna start with a phone and I'm gonna start with iPhone 8, even though it's really old. I don't know why it's still in here. Hey, it is, but it's a good generic size. 375 pixels I like. You can adjust it afterwards. Here's your frame. Okay, and you can say, actually, the new size is not even listed there. I'm gonna use 400 and just type over the top. I'm gonna undo that because iPhone 8 is perfect for what I need. And again, if you're watching in the future and there's no like iPhone 8, you can type in this, uh, 375. 667 to get the same dimensions, but hey, go with whatever is common for you right now. 
The other thing I tend to do is I try and at the meeting figure out what kind of phone my client has because they're going to be potentially testing it on their phone. Okay, so I want to make sure like if they've got some sort of phone, I might use that just so that it, the mock-up works really great on their phone. So we're going to end up with naming loads of these frames because iPhone 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 is not going to help us. So we're going to double click on the word up here or you can double click over here in your layers panel. If you can't see the layers, you might be on assets. Okay, double click it, either one, and let's call this one. Remember our task flow? Okay, we've got, we're going to have our marketing page. We'll call it the home page. Home page slash uh, marketing page. We want another one. So you can go back to your frame tool, click on iPhone 8 again, you'll get another one, and just keep going the way through. We're not going to do huge amounts of shortcuts in this course, but we're going to have to learn a few. The first one's going to be spacebar. So hold down spacebar. It's pretty common lots of design programs, right? And click, hold, and drag. Okay, and I'm going to name it in this one. So remember, our task flow is marketing page, then product details. Another shortcut that we use quite a lot is you can just copy and paste these frames. So just click the name, Command-C on a Mac, or Control-C on a PC, then V. So Command-V, we've got another one, Control-V on a PC. Okay, up to you. I say no shortcuts, <laughs> and I start with lots of shortcuts. Uh, let's put in our four pages. So our task flow said, we do that, product details, what else was there? It was a checkout, okay, and uh, copy paste, spacebar, click and drag. We are going to do our confirmation. Cool, so in the same document, there's no reason why you can't then go, actually, now I want my desktop version. Okay, so I'm gonna click on frame, I'm gonna say tablet, and I'm gonna say we're gonna be designing for the iPad Pro 12, because that's the one I own. Okay, and over here, landscape, portrait. Let's space bar across, landscape, portrait. You can remove them. Okay, I'm gonna click the name, you drag the name, space bar around, drag the name around. Okay, you might say copy, paste, paste, and do the same thing. We're gonna have home page, product details, same with like uh, the desktop versions. I'm going fast here because we're gonna delete them, so you don't need to. Maybe practice playing around with it, okay? And um, if you, see this one's iPad Pro at the moment, okay, you can click on this frame and say, actually, now you are, um, a normal kind of standard desktop. That's a really good desktop size, okay? Um, really common and generic. Now, zooming in and out, Command on a Mac, Control on a PC, and just hit the plus and minus keys, okay? There's a million different ways of doing lots of things here in Figma. I'm gonna give you one way that I think is probably the easiest at your level, or just the generic best way. If you do find another way, and you're horrified I'm not using the hold option, hold the Command key down and use my scroll wheel, what I can do to zoom in and out, you can do that, that's fine. But what I want you to do is for this course is I'm gonna select all of these and I'm just using this tool. It defaults to it every time, so you don't really need to pick it that much. I'm just gonna delete it. This is where I want you to be at the end of this. If you end up in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> I zoomed in into the middle of nowhere. Okay, I'm gonna zoom out, use my space bar, get it right in the middle and then zoom in. Okay, so this is what I want you to get to. I want just four boring old frames, okay, and I want you to name them all. And the last thing I wanna show you kind of kicking off this getting used to Figma is naming your file. Just so you know, you're gonna end up with lots of untitled documents. <laughs> it just happens, I don't know, this program loves to have untitled documents. <laughs> um, so we're gonna be really specific and actually name them. If we click off in the background here, can you see it appears up there? If you've got something selected, it goes away. Have nothing selected. Click in no man's land, and you can click up here, and you can say, give it a name. Okay, and you've already got your brief, right? So mine is Scott. Yours is going to be something different. But we're all going to call ours Ecom V1. Okay, so you pick your you know, the name of your company and put Ecom V1. Our e-commerce version 1. Just the V1, just something. A, B, C, 1, 2, 3. It doesn't matter. As long as you're not like a final person. Final one, final revisited. Final, final. If you're laughing, it's you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking to you. Give it some versioning numbers. There are some sweet features later on for like versioning within the document, but that's later on. Another thing is if you have got a bunch of untitled, you can. Let's go back to, I want to explore this little house or go back to, yeah, go back to the little house. Remember, make sure you're at your little name here and not community, okay? And what you'll notice is, look, there he is down there, uh, Ecom1. If you've got lots of uh, untitled already, okay, I've planned mine out, you can right-click them and go to rename and just do it there. Or open them up and do what we just did. Back to this tab, back to home. Keep practicing that. Home base, into our work, kind of like a browser.
All right, that is our basic setup. These are frames. The whole thing's called a design file. Frames have other sneaky settings that we'll talk about later in the course, but for the moment, consider them pages or artboards, but they call them frames. Onwards to the next video. Hi everyone, we're actually gonna start making things in Figma now. And what I'm gonna do over the next couple of videos is I'm gonna introduce things like uh, type in this one, and the next one's gonna be like circles and buttons and colors, and uh, just the stuff that we need to get going. We're not going to, I'm just gonna, you know, touch on them and throughout the course, we'll get deeper and deeper into them rather than trying to like, I don't know, click every button to do with type in this video. We're gonna get all the basics in and when appropriate throughout the course, we'll dive a bit deeper into them. So let's get started. In this video, we're gonna look at type and the various quirks in Figma. All right, so let's start off with the type tool. It's this letter T here. If you hover above stuff, can you see it says text? And the shortcut is T on my keyboard. So I can tap T on my keyboard. I'm not gonna go through all the shortcuts. Okay, but if there's one that you're using quite a lot, hover above it and it should tell you what it is. See, see, see for adding a comment. All right, so we've got two kinds of text boxes. You click once and you can type forever. Okay, that is this one here. It is called a auto width box because <laughs> I know that off by heart. Uh, and the other type of box you're gonna create is a click and drag box. Okay, so we'll grab the type tool, click and drag it out. Okay, instead of clicking once, we click and drag it, we get this option here, which is the fixed size box. Okay, and this one is just means that when I get to the end, it will break. Okay, and we'll use both of these in this course, especially for this wireframe. So I'm gonna undo. Uh, if you don't know, there's edit undo. If you're on the browser version, it is in here, edit undo. Okay, and you'll see the shortcut for it there. Undo, redo. So we're gonna do two things. We're going to do uh, auto width. Okay, so type tool, click once, and just type in your brand name. Okay, so mine is Scott Headphones. Okay, and when you finish, you can just kind of like click out in this no man's land. Okay, and you can move it around and stuff. And um, grab the type tool again, and let's do a box about this sort of size. Okay, and we're gonna type in our marketing mission. So just type in something like, this is our marketing message. You've got to be at this stage with things, it depends on who you're working for. And um, it's best to keep everything very generic. Try not to use language, you know, marketing speak here because you might send off to testing and instead of people testing like the flow, and um, they might end up testing, you know, coming back with spelling mistakes or like, uh, I don't know, there might be controversy about the marketing message. That's not right. Let's get it to copywriting. Okay, so at the moment, we're just going to keep everything as simple as we can to take out any sort of variables for our testing, just so that we're focused. Now, you can switch these later on. Let's say that this one here, we want to actually make it that auto width. Okay, so we can click it here. Same with this one. We can make it a fixed box. And the difference now is, watch this when I start typing. Okay, kind of blows out of the box and it's got a fixed width. So you can change them later on. I'm gonna hit undo a couple of times. Okay, I'm using my shortcut Command Z on a Mac, Control Z on a PC to get back to. Huh. Undos aren't as consistent as you would imagine um, from other programs. Undos, can you see the undo didn't put my rectangle back to the big size? It's undoing my type, okay. Okay, but it's not doing that um, big rectangle. This is pretty common throughout Figma. Sometimes you can like draw an arrow, change the arrowhead, hit undo, and it leaves the arrowhead there. <laughs> this may change over time, but it's just one of those quirks about Figma. Sometimes if you hit undo, it decides not to always do what you ask. <laughs> it does bits of it. Um, so what I've got is I've got it selected with my selection tool. I've made sure it's a kind of fixed size. I'm going to drag it out so it's a bit bigger because what I'd like it to do is I'm going to play around with just the basics here and um, let's look at font size and the basics over here. I'm not going to cover them all because you know how to go font size is a little drop down. Look at that. Go to something nice and big. You might have to select your text first. So double click it, highlight it and say over here, I'm going to make it nice and big. And because it's a fixed box, it's going to kind of break on the sides here. Uh, left align, centered, you know, all that sort of stuff. One thing I will show you is that, let's say things, if you hover above them, okay, that little icon there is the line height, okay, but you can click and drag them, any of the icons, so I'm gonna undo that, undo again, there it goes, okay, if you see the little icon, so over here, not draggable, over here, on any of these little icons, you can click hold and drag them, so I tend to do this quite a lot, okay, when I'm working, and you'll see me throughout the course, okay, dragging line height and tracking and letter spacing and that sort of stuff. 
So that's one little trick. The other one I do quite a bit is, um, let's say this is not draggable, I wish it was, okay, but if you click in here and see my little cursor flashing, if I hit the arrow key on my keyboard, just the plain old up, down, left, right, use the up and the down, okay? If you hold shift, it goes up in big chunks, okay, in tens, units of tens. So that's true of like every box in here. If I want the width to be a bit wider, up and down, okay, or hold shift, go up in big chunks, and I'm making the width of this text box bigger, undo, undo, wrecking my boxes. Okay, but for the fonts, I use it quite a bit, just kind of going up and down. I'm looking at my uh, desktop, I'm not really looking over here, I'm just kind of checking, is this a good font size? Not a good font size. Now, when it comes to fonts here, you, there's a couple of things. We are picking font sizes now, and you've got to really be at 100%. At the moment, we're at 86, you might be at 100, but if you're picking a font size, you're like, hmm, that's too small. You've got to try and pick a font size at 100%. Okay, you don't want to be, you know, trying to pick a font size when you zoom right out because you can make it too big. Um, and this, because this is going to be on a mobile device, okay, it's a mobile website, it's not an app, but it's only going to be viewed through a mobile website at this kind of, um, kind of ratio, this height, okay, it's best to be actually picking font sizes on your phone, okay, I'll show you a little bit later in the course, not too far, we're going to actually preview everything on a device, okay, so don't be spending too much time on you know, deciding, what was it, 12? Should it be 16, 14? Actually get it onto the device and start looking. All right, the last thing I wanna share with you when you are kind of at this font picking stage, especially for a wireframe, is I want you to pick a not font, a font that has zero character. I feel bad, because this is Roboto. Sorry, Roboto, you have zero character. And I don't want, you know, let's not go all brush script, okay? Or even if it's a beautiful font and it's exciting, okay? We want really plain fonts here because when we do do our testing, um, we want feedback not on like, hey, I don't like that font or that's not communicating right. We, we don't wanna, you know, bring that into the conversation. We wanna keep it all separate and just have it very, very simple. So it'd be really common to use something like Roboto or Open Sans, you know, let's have a look. Roboto, Open Sans, what's another one? Source Sans, Source. Okay, you can tell. <laughs> These guys are not the guys you invite to the party. Okay, they've got no, they've got little personality. They're clear and they are professional and great for a wireframe, but they're no brush script. So whatever you decide, Pick one, we're gonna use Roboto for this because it's, I don't know, the most generic of them all. Plus it has a lot of weights that you can play around with often. If you don't have Roboto, you can find it online, download it, and it is, yeah, it is pretty common around the place and it is free. You can use Arial or Calibri or whatever you want to use. Actually, <laughs> you're not allowed to use Arial or Calibri. It's too Microsoft-y. Um, all right, so we've picked a non-font. We're gonna throw in a few different things for our mock-up, so we've got our, um, for our logo as well, we're just gonna keep it super simple. Um, even if you have, if your company already has a brand, it's probably appropriate to throw it in in black and white, just keep it simple. Because the brand isn't being developed yet for this company, um, we're just gonna keep it super simple. I'm gonna play around with uh, fonts. Now, this is where I break all my own rules. Like, hey, don't pick a font that has character, stay away from, you know, and then you can't help yourself. You're like, man, that leading's really big. <laughs> uh, if you want leading to go back to zero, just delete it and hit enter, and it goes back to auto, okay? And even then you're like, oh, okay, I'm just gonna, oh, wrong one, this one here, just take it over a little bit. I can't help myself. You, uh, yeah, do as I say, don't do as I do. Don't be playing around with letter spacing and stuff and making it, your wireframe looks good making your wireframe look really good, mm, it's hard to stop that. You can do a little bit of design. So we need a couple of things, so we're gonna keep that, and we're gonna copy and paste and use this again. Wow, that went weird. And when you do copy and paste, did you notice that, so there's only one of them there now. If I copy and paste in Figma, it goes back over the top. So there's two of them right over the top. Okay, so that's a, it's a weirdness, but hey, it works. We're gonna have a buy now button, buy now. Now, I end up duplicating instead of copying and pasting. You may or may not do this. On a Mac, you hold down the Option key. You see the little arrow? It's a little double double arrow there. On a PC, it is your Option key. So if you do that before you start dragging, so Selection Tool, hold down that key, Option or Alt, drag it out, and you get a second one. Figma is really good at lining things up. Can you see? Oh, so handy. Okay, we've got a Buy Now and a Learn More. Okay, we are going to go centered for that one. 
I need another one up here. That's going to be my product shot. I think that's all the text we're going to do for this particular mock-up. All right, so we will go into a little bit more text detail later on, but it, see this little dotted line down here? This is where you get into the, it's pretty amazing how deep it does go. If you're a designer who loves a bit of, loves a bit of, loves a bit of ligatures and all sorts of <laughs> amazing things, you can see alignment, not that exciting. Decoration, underlines, strike throughs, nothing. Okay, so there's a lot. Bullet points are in here. You can start doing uppercase, lowercase. I won't cover them all. Okay, we will look at little bits throughout the course, but here's all the, if you really want to get into stylistic sets and man, it gets deep. So it is, most of it's just sitting here in your kind of right menu. They call it the right panel. Sometimes they call it the properties inspector. This thing here on the right. Okay, you can get most of it just here. This little dotted line gets you a bunch more. All right, we've actually made something. Kind of. <laughs> Bunch of boring text. Let's get into the next video and make some ah, boring rectangles and buttons. I'll see you in the next video. Hey everyone, this video we're going to draw some rectangles and some circles and some rounded corners. It's very exciting. Let's jump in. All right, let's first of all put in our kind of product shot. We're going to put in a placeholder image for that. Okay, I'm going to use my selection tool, just click and drag over a bunch of them. Okay, and then I can drag it down. So I've got a bit of space. Okay, let's grab the rectangle tool. It's one of those ones that you'll probably learn the shortcut for. And they're all hiding in here. See rectangle, lines, all the kind of basic shapes. Okay, so R's for the rectangle tool, which makes sense. Okay, so I'm going to click, hold, and drag it out. And you get the big gray box. And you'll notice our text disappeared. Okay, so this brings us to layering. Okay, so over here, if you can't see it, you might be on assets. Go to layers. You'll see there's my home page frame. Okay, and inside of that are all these different things. Okay, all the different texts we've added. Now we've got a rectangle, but it's on top. So we can do a couple of things. Right click and say, send to the back, please. And it's just that shortcut. You'll learn that one quite a bit as well. Learn the different shortcuts at your level. You might be ready for shortcuts. You might be not. You might be freaking out. <laughs> so just right click and say, actually send to the back. Or I want you to practice. I've undone that. Can you see here? I can drag this kind of like more like Photoshop. I'm holding it, holding it, dragging it. Now it's at the bottom of all those guys and I can see it. Easy. I'm going to undo it and show you just one more painful way, mainly because there is a ton of ways of doing everything in Figma. Okay, and I'm going to show you the way that I think makes most sense for your level and what's really common and useful. But if you find a different way and you're like, hey, why didn't he show us that way? That's heaps better. Okay, if you find it and you like it, you can do it. Okay, but let's say this one here. So this little Figma menu here. If you're on a Mac, you've got this top bit along the top here, which is exactly the same as edit. Where is it? Uh, Arrange, you can see how, <laughs> uh, no, I don't want to arrange. Object, there it is there. You can see how much I use this menu, not very often. Okay, so you can, on a Mac, you'll see these on the top and they will correspond. See, file, there's file, edit, there's edit. So often I use these ones along the top here, but I know if you're using the browser version, these aren't there. On a PC, these aren't there. These are exactly the same. So I'll try to remember through this course that I'm going to go to object send backwards, okay? But you might find in this course that Dan's going up to arrange up the top here and you're like, hey, I don't have that. There it is there, look. Okay, so I'm going to go object, send it back. Yeah, loads of ways of doing the same thing. Let's kind of get that in the middle there. You'll notice that a Figma is just really naturally wanting to go to the center of things, center of boxes, center of artboards, just drag it around. You don't have to do a lot. There are the full on arranges along the top here, kind of, you know, arrange center, arrange to the left but often just dragging it around does perfectly well. All right, let's do our buttons down the bottom here. So I'm gonna zoom in, Command plus or Control plus on a PC, and I'm gonna hold my spacebar key down and click and drag. Okay, R for the rectangle tool, or just go up there, drag it around. We know that it is on top. You can drag it over here. What's the shortcut? It's a test, okay? What's the shortcut to go all the way to the back? It's that square bracket next to P on your keyboard. There it is, down, up is the other one, down, up, down. Cool, so I've got that, button, I'm going to hold down my option key and drag out another one. You might have to resize this. Okay, I want to move on to rounded corners because when I said do not, whatever you do, don't design this thing. Okay, uh, it's hard because you're like, I want rounded corners. <laughs> you're not the boss of me, Dan. I'm going to make some little design choices. Okay, so with the rectangle selected, you, you might notice these little dots. If you don't see these little dots, if I zoom right out, minus, you see they go away. So those little dots in the corners help with rounded corners. If you can't see them, just keep zooming in. Look, still can't see them. Why oh, are they there? Yeah, they're there. <laughs> Zoom out. There's a level, yeah, look there. 
they're not there. Zoom one more in, I can grab them and drag them. Okay, and you're like, hmm, there you go. Nice round of corners. Um, you can do it, I'm gonna go zoom all the way out to 100%. The shortcut is, where is it? So this is the long way, 100%. See this, shift, that little arrow key is shift. <laughs> I was like, what is that one? Especially on a Mac, I'm like, what the hang is that guy? <laughs> I have to look at my keyboard. Luckily it's written on it. You think I'd know. Uh, but so shift zero. Okay, on the top there goes to 100% because that's a, probably a better place to be designing rounded corners because you're like, that's the way it's gonna look. So if I'm doing it here, I can actually just do it here in my kind of property inspector here, this right panel. And I can say, actually, let's try it at, use my arrow keys. Remember the sweet shortcut, up one. Oh, how does it look? Up another one. Oh, smashing it up, down. Okay, so I'm gonna just put in some rounded corners, five. Um, it's handy because you can get consistency. Select this other one, go five. On this one, they're all going to have five rounded corners. Look at that. Because we are doing rounded corners, it's not appropriate right now, but if I click on this, zoom in enough so I can see this radius, you can actually uh, hold down the Option key on a Mac, Alt key on a PC, and actually just click one of them and go, look at that. Undo it, because we don't need it right now, but you probably had that question, like, can I do one by itself? You can. Just hold down the Option key on a Mac, Alt key on a PC, okay, and click it and drag it. There we go. And before we go, let's add our little circle down the bottom here. So the circle tool, it, the ellipse is the O. Okay, I'm going to drag it out. Another thing that I haven't quite covered yet, if you want it to be completely um, circular or square, okay, you hold down the shift key while you're dragging. So watch this. I'm going to go back to my circle tool. And before I start dragging, hold down the shift key, drag it out, and you can see, perfect circle. If I let go of it, ellipse, okay, or oval. Back to holding shift, I'm gonna get about that. And for the moment, I'm gonna put it down here, I'm gonna grab my type tool, okay, and click once, and I'm gonna hit my plus, and I'm gonna pick an appropriate font size. Now with type, okay, I wanna move it, and it's just gonna kinda of select it, so click off in the background, and then kinda of just drag it to where you want. Font size, in here I'm using my up arrow to get it to a kind of a size that I want. Bold's kinda of weird for that, there we go. All right, that is gonna be good enough for this video. Circles, exciting. Rectangles, ooh, one little bonus thing for circles. <laughs> I was gonna do this later, but look at this. See the circle? What's that thing do? You probably already dragged it, you ready? Mm, nom, 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 nom. <laughs> Absolutely useless, never used it. I, I can see, I'm like, yeah, that does a bar graph. And I have not mocked up a bar graph before, so. Uh, sorry, pie chart is what I want. Okay, so you can, that's what that thing does. <laughs> Anyway, uh, let's get on to the next video. Hi everyone, just a quick little segue. I wanted to check on you, see if you're enjoying the course. How was it? Is it okay? If you think it's good enough for a like, give it a like. Um, and think about subscribing to the channel. Got lots of other stuff like this, so yeah, subscribe away. Uh, also know that um, this is a short part of a longer course, okay? Like this is the first 20-ish videos. So if you're enjoying this and you wanna go further, Okay, the, the full course is about 111 videos, about, it's exactly that. And what you're seeing on screen now, okay, so these are some of the things that we continue on in the full course. So if you wanna go further on after this course, there will be a link in the description or there should be a card there in the top right now. Come check out the full course or otherwise continue on with this amazing free stuff. All right, let's carry on, enjoy the rest. All right, I hope you're sitting down. This video, we're gonna look at color. You ready, city, boom. It's green and black. It's not very exciting, I know. I am going to try and convince you that you don't need a lot of colors when it comes to your wireframes. You should probably leave it gray, but hey, we're learning about color in this video. Let's jump in and I'll show you what you need to know. All right, to work with color, um, select on something. We're gonna use this big uh, big rectangle here. That's the default color for Figma. All you do is click on it, okay? So it now fill, click on it once, and you get this little guy. If you've never used a color picker before, this little dot's where our color is. You can click him and drag him around, okay? So at the moment, you can only pick red, okay? To change it, this little hue slider here, drag it along to the kind of zone that you want it to be. I'm gonna pick some sort of greeny thing, okay? And then move this around. Okay, to get the full saturation, no saturation, light, dark, somewhere in there. Okay, other things you should know about in here, if you want full white, just click, drag, and drag it like past 
you know, like just keep going and it'll be full white. And either of these dark ones down the bottom are gonna be the same. Okay, so white, black, or that one is black, doesn't matter. And I'm gonna pick some sort of light greeny color. So you could pick it from the brand, okay, or just pick like light blue is probably the most common kind of, you know, wireframe color. It's the default and like XD and a few other ones. So you end up seeing this kind of like mm, tealy blue thing throughout. I'm gonna pick a slightly greener version. You pick anything you like. Other things to know about color is transparency down the bottom here. You can make things slightly transparent, which makes no sense unless I bring this all the way to the front. Okay, so I'm using my square bracket. You can see it's kind of covering things with a bit of transparency. I'm gonna go back to, actually I was gonna change that there at 100%. It doesn't matter whether you do it here, zoop, and you can see it there 100%, or you just type it in here and you say, I want it to be 50. Or same again, you can kind of use your up and down arrows to kind of go through it all. So I want mine to be 100, perfect. Okay, and if you are a bit more of a color nerd than you might be, like me, okay, hexadecimal numbers, that's the kind of like web version of a color. You might not like that. You might like the RGB versions. There you go. It's RGBA, so you've still got transparency at the end. Red, green, blue. You might be mixing colors from maybe a corporate spec manual or something else. Um, other colorways, CSS, you probably, if you're a developer, you might be working this way. Okay, your RGBA colors, you can type them in there. Um, hue, saturation, luminance, I don't often use, I use this quite a bit, hue, saturation, brightness. Um, actually, do I do it in this one? Probably not in this program very often. I do it a lot in things like Premiere and uh, Illustrator, but not here in Figma. So I'm gonna stick to the hexadecimal number. Other things I wanna point out is the eyedropper. So we've got this here, I wanna steal this color. So I select on it, go to my fill color, click on the little eyedropper, and you'll notice, can you see up here, there's like a zoomed in version, and watch this, I can move it around, can you see it just zooms in on things? So it's, you know, ours is pretty easy because we can pick this big rectangle, but sometimes you're trying to pick a teeny tiny bit of color from like that bit. It's gonna be that weird light gray. Okay, so eyedropper, I'm gonna click on this one. Same with this fella, you, eyedropper, you. Now to get to that eyedropper, very often I won't be going into the color and picker to do it. So I'm gonna undo to get my grays back. So I select on it, there is the shortcut for I, for eyedropper, like I, <laughs> not E-Y-E, -E, the letter I, okay? It's a shortcut, so selected it, hit the eyedropper, click on that, there's a lot of that going on. However, you want get that, this, all the same color for me, and be resilient, don't try and add a bunch of colors, okay? Keep it really just black, grays, whites, and you know, a color just to sex it up a tiny bit, okay? When you start adding color palettes to it, you again start entering different parts, uh, you know, to the conversation about, oh, is this the right color? Is it the right brand color? Just keep it generic, keep it gray, then nobody's gonna complain. The last thing about colors is um, down here, can you see document colors? You're like, oh great, those are the colors that I've used already, okay? So this though gets mad big and not very useful. Um, it's fine for the moment, because you're like, okay, I wanna go back to that gray that we had before. There it is there, it's something that's been used. Okay, or there's that green. Is that the green? It's the same green. It gets, yeah, later on, we're gonna look at this and we're gonna look at team library colors. It's quite later in the document, plus we're gonna look at something called color styles in the not too distant future, where we kind of tidy it all up and get a bit more consistent. But document colors will show everything that have been used in this document, so it gets a bit mad, but that's what they are. All right, that's the basics of colors. Let's jump into the next video. Actually, we're going nowhere. It's driving you mad, it's driving me mad. <laughs> you can't do that, Dan. Uh, so this needs to be bigger. We're gonna do some responsive buttons later on, but for the moment, I can't live with this. It needs to be bigger and this needs to be more in the center. One of the things I wanna show you, another little shortcut might be handy, is, because you wanna like make it bigger on both sides, you can hold down the option key on a Mac, or key on a PC, and when you're scaling things, instead of just like dragging the edges and then trying to move it around, if you hold down the yeah, option key on a Mac, or key on a PC, kind of does it from both sides, and you're like, that's better, phew. All right, now we can move on to the next video. Is that even in the middle, Dan? Yeah, a range, look. That is better. Whew. Let's do the same thing with this one. I got closer with that one. Some of you are like, why does he care so much? And then some of you be like, oh my goodness, finally, fix the button. And will he ever get rid of the full stop? It's not lining up properly, is it? Anyway, let's get on to the next video now. Hi everyone, in this video we're gonna look at strokes, uh, strokes around the outside, that's the line around the outside here. We'll look at burger menus, 
which is just a group of lines, but we'll also look at the ends here. Can you see they've got nice little rounded lines instead of this kind of like big flat end on the edge? We'll look at setting some of the defaults that every time we draw something like a rectangle, it is kind of set to the rounded corners and the stroke we like and the color we like. There's a few things we cover in this video. All right, let's jump in. All right, so let's do our stroke. So we're gonna click on the rectangle. The stroke is this one here. By default, you get a fill, you don't get a stroke. To add a stroke, hit the little plus button. Okay, and we've got a black stroker on the outside. Uh, the stroke width, we can drag. Okay, I'm gonna put in just two for mine. Do you have to have a stroke around stuff? You don't, but we're learning stuff. The one thing you will get annoyed about later on is if you do have like a style, you know, you've decided that this green with that stroker on the outside and you're like, okay, I'm gonna draw another one on this product uh, details here. Ah, for my rectangle tool and you're like, ah, oh, it's gray. <laughs> it's gray again, it's got no stroke and no rounded corners and you're like, okay, so I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna change it to five and go slightly mad trying to get the eyedropper tool. And So what you can do is you can get to a point you're like, actually, I like that. I like my rounded corners, I like my green, I like my stroke. And I can go change it to the default. Okay, so um, let's go to our little Figma icon here, okay, and go to edit. And there's this one here, it says set default properties. Nothing really happens, except that word appears. <laughs> okay, but now if I click off, grab my rectangle tool, draw something out, look at that. I got a sweet green rectangle with a black line around the outside and yeah, rounded corners. So that is how you set the defaults and I'm gonna leave that. And um, another thing you can do is, because these are already drawn in the past, I can't go like, I don't know, I want it to now look like this. Okay, so we don't have style set up, which we'll do later in the course. What you can do is you can click on this guy and say, edit, copy his properties. These are his properties over here. Okay, and we go copy them and we click on him and it doesn't matter what color he was, if we go to edit, paste properties, he comes along. Okay, we can click more than one, got the two rectangles. Okay, and let's go edit, paste properties, here we go. Okay, so that's stroke. Let's look at a bit more stroke. We got on a bit of a tangent there with setting the defaults. Um, let's look at doing our little burger menu at the top. So I'm gonna zoom in, remember Command Plus on a Mac, Control Plus on a PC, and kind of get up here-ish to get started at least. And let's look at, let's drop down the rectangle. So you just kind of click and hold it and it will show you other things. I'm gonna use the line tool. Okay, and I'm going to use my line tool to click, hold and drag. That didn't work, <laughs> I don't know why. Okay, click, hold and drag. Okay, it will try and be straight. If it's kind of not straight enough for you, okay, hold down the shift key. Shift key will do something with the line tool. Remember it did with the circle tool, it made a perfect circle. With the line tool, it just makes it go in kind of some you know, 45 degrees, 90 degrees, and straight. So I want something kind of that long. Don't worry about how long it is just yet. We'll make it, then we'll go out to, um, you know, 100% and kind of make it the right size. So we're gonna grab this guy. We're gonna have three of them. So we're gonna either copy and paste. Remember, copy and paste has that weird option where it's, well, it's not weird, but it's over the top of it. So remember, I tend to just use the selection tool, hold down my option key on a Mac, alt key on a PC, and just drag another version out. And it really wants to go underneath it, which is great. I'm gonna introduce one more shortcut. If you're like, this, if this guy introduces another shortcut here, I'm gonna scream, close your eyes, or your ears. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna introduce you to the Command D or Control D, really common in Figma. Okay, it just means do it again. Okay, duplicate, do it again, whatever you wanna call it. Okay, so Command D will just do the last thing I did. So I can go Command D, 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 D. It's great when you're doing like lists and images and you've got four of them and you just wanna kinda of like make a new one. It doesn't matter what you're doing it with. So let's say I want some type and I'm making a list, drag it out holding my Option key on a Mac, Alt key on a PC, Command D, 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 or Control D, 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 D on a PC. Okay, you can open your ears now with the people that are <laughs> screaming about my shortcuts. Uh, so with these lines here, you're like, how big should the nav be? The best way is to copy an existing template. So I'll show you kind of some of the templates that Figma's got, okay? But if you are building stuff on your own, especially things like icons, it's best to be, remember, at shift zero, okay? Or at 100% up here, so that you've got a good sense of the size, okay? Because if you have them like this, they're gonna be very hard to click. Or if they're gonna be big jumbo ones, it's just not that fun. <laughs> well, they don't look like they should. So I got lucky with mine. I think mine are appropriately sized here. So what you can do is just drag a box around them all, grab the corner and scale them to what you think they should feel like. That feels good to me. Okay, and I'm going to put them in a kind of appropriate 
position for a navigation. So it's called the burger menu or the nav sandwich. Okay, uh, that thing you click that gives you all the sort of options. Really common in the top right, but can appear in the top left as well. So let's look at a bit more strokey goodness. So I'm going to zoom in on it because I want the little bubble ends. Now um, over here, my stroke, the stroke weight we've talked about. Okay, so start and end point. They do two things. Click on the first one. You can put an arrow at the end. That's great. If I hit undo, it doesn't go away. Maybe this is just on my machine. I don't know why. Undo, <laughs> undo. That's one of those quirks. I'll leave it in this course because it's a weird quirk. Is it just on my computer? No, I think it's universal, but it, it's probably going to be gone in the future. It's one of those updates where it's on somebody's, some developer's bug fix list. It's not super important because I can go back to none, but my undo doesn't turn those off. We've gone off on a tangent. Let's stay on point because I want to show you these. And there's three options. So your stroke at the moment just finishes right at the end. Can you see there? The second one, I'm going to go this stroke has a rounded end. And that is the pretty one that I want. Okay, so it's the stroke still ends there, but there's this like little round. That's a butt cap. That is a round cap. And this is going to be a square cap. So this one here, look at the difference between this top one and the bottom one. The stroke is the same size. Okay, underneath, but this has got like a big square cap on the end. This has got an unfortunately named butt cap, and that has got a nice round cap. That's what I want. I want all you guys, you'll see mixed quite a lot if you've selected stuff and it doesn't know what to say. Instead of going question mark, I'm confused, it just says mixed. Okay, which means one of them, there are all sorts of different things. I'm going to say you're all round, which only partially worked. Oh, yeah, we're going to do the end as well. Here we go. All right, so. What have we learned? There are some quirks to Figma, like the undo with arrows. Uh, we've learned about strokes. Actually, last thing I want to do is with images, okay, and we've written uh, you know product shot, but it's actually more common to just draw a big cross through the middle as a placeholder for an image. So I'm just going to grab my line tool, and I'm going to go from this corner over to here, and this corner. You got to go back to the tool every time. So it'd be really common to have that as like a, that's kind of a you know a visual cue that there's an image to come here, but it's not available right now. The other thing you might do just while we're on the topic is instead of those lines, I'm gonna get rid of them for a second and bring them back, is we can put in a like an icon that shows an image. So a really common one for this is an icon, I'll show you it. Um, so it's in your exercise files. So how do you bring in an image, okay, or an icon? Um, you can go up to, there's a couple of ways, um, there's this way here, okay, so it's weird. Under your rectangle tool is where you bring in images as well. So I can place an image, there's the shortcut. The other way is under Figma, you can go to edit, no, file, place image. Use the shortcut quite a bit. But um, I'm going to bring in an image under your exercise files, under icons, bring in the one that says icon image, okay, and click open. And with, an, with this, okay, if you bring in an image, you click once, it'll come through at gigantic size or whatever size that it was. I'm going to undo, go back to my uh, import image, find him again, is you can click and drag and it gives you a more appropriate size. And what you'll notice is that it's squishing it, which is killing me inside. <laughs> Never leave your icon like that. Um, hold down the shift key, okay, if you want to drag it out. Remember, same thing with like the lines making them go straight and the rectangle being perfectly square. So that would be very common as well for a uh, you know, placeholder image. We are going to not do that for the moment. I don't mind. <laughs> I don't really care. Lines, actually, no, keep the lines there because we're going to look at something in the next video that is kind of reliant on having a couple of diagonal lines there. So, all right, that is Strokes 101. Let's get into the next video. Hi everyone, I'm going to briefly introduce object editing mode, this kind of stripy lines where you're stuck currently. You might be trapped in here right now and you don't know how to escape. Let me show you how to escape and what it's actually used for. So I want to introduce this early in the course because if you're a double clicker, you've probably already been in there by accident and I'll show you how to get out. So I'm going to grab my rectangle tool. I'm just going to draw something out. And normally you can just kind of grab the edges and you're like, okay, that's imagine how I want it. And um, but if you want to like say break the edge and distort this, you double well, there's the official way of getting in there. So I've got it selected. Look, there's the official way. 
edit object. Click on that and nothing really happens except this top menu changes. Watch it again, click on that and you get these extra features. We'll go over them in more detail when we start drawing our own icons, but I wanna, yeah, I wanna get you escaped now early in the course. So the official way to get into it, click that, okay? And what you can do is you can grab a corner and drag it and you're like, yay, destroyed it, okay? Or, you know, manipulated it. You can also click the center and delete the center of your rectangle. Click on this edge here, delete the top part. So that's what object editing mode is. It kind of breaks it from that kind of, you know, that rectangle that does only rectangle stuff. And I show you here because maybe a lot of people get lost or stuck in here. So I'm gonna undo that. Now the official way to get out is to click done. But the normal way, the way most people do, is just to double click on the background. So official way, have it selected, in, out. Unofficial way, double click it, double click the background to get out. I'm gonna delete that, I don't need it. I just wanted to show you what object editing mode was and how to get out if you got trapped. All right, on to the next video. Okay, let's look at scaling versus the selection tool because you're gonna need both of them and they're a bit quirky from other programs that I've used and yeah, caught me out at the beginning, so let's do it together. So with my selection tool, I'm just gonna click on the rectangle. I'm not in object editing mode, remember? Okay, and all I wanna do is I've got this tool here, the default tool, and I can click, click the edge and I can drag it around. That's kind of how you imagined it. Um, you know, and that's most of the time what you wanna do. But what you'll notice is, is that the stroke stays at two the whole time, okay? And if I do something else, let's say that I select both the text and the rectangle, and I'm like, I want it to be bigger. Okay, and I drag it out. Huh, that's weird. Maybe if I hold shift, hold shift, still doesn't work. That's where the scale tool comes in. So there's times where you actually want to just make everything bigger, stroke, type, everything. And it's this tool here, hiding underneath the selection tool, click, hold, drag, don't hold and drag, just click and hold, and there it is there, the scale tool. Okay, click on that. I've got both of these selected, and I can just click and drag this the corner there and if I hold nothing down it does it kind of proportionately scales it up both the stroke can you see the stroke got bigger and the font and the rectangle so there's times when you need both let's say in this case I've drawn this too big for what I need it to be so I'm going to go to my scale tool and I'm going to make it a bit smaller and both the font because I use that as the rectangle and my little stroke gets smaller I'm going to bring it to the front using my square bracket even if you group stuff first, you still gotta use a scale tool. What I mean by that is, let's say that we do, what do we got? These two, okay, select them both. I'm gonna right click it, I'm gonna say, you are group that selection. And I'm gonna use my normal old selection tool. It still does the same thing, even though you think, I've grouped it. Nope, still does the weird stuff. So you gotta to switch to the scale tool. And you do it so often that there's a shortcut. And you're like, excellent, that's easy to remember. It's probably S, because it's the scale tool. Nope, it's K. <laughs> I don't know why. But don't worry, the S tool, if I hit S, it's the slice tool that nobody uses. There's people out there probably use it, but I never do. It's a big waste of a good shortcut. <laughs> Though, we have to use K. That's just the way it is. So, V is the shortcut for the selection tool, and K, you end up toggling, like, I, again, I'm trying not to do too many shortcuts, just the ones that are really helpful, and I'm gonna... I'm gonna beat them into you throughout this course. So you're gonna to go to the end, you know, and be like, I know it's K, I know it's V, because they're helpful and it's hard to remember them sometimes. So you need some beating. All right, it's okay, and you can scale them up. Perfect. So back to the selection tool and off to the next video. Hi everyone. Uh, this video, we're gonna look at the differences between groups and frames. Um, up until now in this course, it's been pretty basic, right? Like the type tool does what you imagine, the rectangle tool does what you imagine. Like it's not rocket science. Ready for this video to be rocket science-y. Uh, I introduced it earlier in the course because it was probably the hardest thing I had to get used to um, coming to Figma. So I'll introduce it a little bit now and a little bit later on, a little bit more. And you know, towards the end, you will become master of frames, but if you get to the end of this video and you're like, oh, I kinda get it, but I don't kinda get it, don't worry. I'm introducing it early so that we can revisit it a few times. All right, first let's understand groups. Let's draw a bunch of shapes up here. So we're going to grab, we'll do rectangle tool. Okay. We'll do three shapes. Let's look at the polygon tool. Okay, get them roughly. You don't need to be the right size. They can be three circles. I'm doing these because, I don't know, it looks good. So make three of something, okay? And what you'll see here on this product details frame, 
okay, is my ellipse, my polygon, and my rectangle. I can select them all, and I can right-click them and group them, or the really common Command-G on a Mac, Control-G on a PC, and they're grouped. You're like, great. What happens? Over here, can you see the icon has changed? Okay, it's called Group 2. Where is it, Group? It must be a group somewhere else. I made a group earlier, didn't I? There it is, it's their button. So Group 2, I can rename. So this could be my icons. Great. This little icon here is not important, but you'll get used to these shapes. So that there, the little dotted line, is a group. So I can look around, look, there's another group. And I can look inside the group of my layers, see this little turn down arrow here. So yeah, you can see stuff inside of it. You can say, all right, I wanna move, like grouping is useful because we know what grouping is. You can grab them and they move together, okay? But I can go into them individually by either clicking them here in the layers panel and going, okay, this needs to be a bit further this way. Or we can kind of go into that object editing mode. So let's double click on the background, click on it once, double click, we kind of go inside of it, inside of the group, and we can operate, you know, work on it, double click it to come out. And it's still a nice, helpful group. You can ungroup by right clicking it and going to ungroup. Okay, and then it kind of comes out of that dotted group and it's back to being single units. I'm gonna go back, Command G or Control G on a PC and group it. So what's the difference? Uh, let's make two versions. So I'm going to duplicate this fella and I'm gonna right click it and say ungroup. So I got this grouped one, you can see them here, it's called grouped two. These guys here are just hanging out by themselves in this frame. So what we're gonna do is very similar. I'm gonna select them all. And instead of right clicking and saying group, we're gonna frame selection. And it's basically exactly the same as a group, except the icon's different. Can you see over here? There's my top one. Let's move the layer order so it makes more sense. There's my group, that's them there. There's my frame. The icon's different. You get this like little, um, what do you call it? Pound symbol, hash symbol, grid whatever it is, okay? But they do a lot of the same thing. So you can still see them in there. They're all still trapped inside of this nice frame. So what's the difference, Dan? Is the difference is that frame can survive on his own. The group, if I go into this group and say, you are gone and you are gone, remember double clicking it to go inside the group, the group disappears by group, okay? If I undo that, because I want them back. The frame on the other hand, if I go in, delete this guy, this one, you're left with a frame, which can be weird when you're new. You're like, what are all these empty frames everywhere? Because the frame can exist without the group. Why is this useful, Dan? Okay, it is useful because, I'm undoing, okay, is because I can do things like, let's say I wanna cut that off. Okay, I can drag my frame in. Can you see it? It's, it's operating differently. If I drag the edge of this, look what happens. Squidgy. If I drag the edge of this in, okay, I can do things like this, clip the content. So I can use the frame as kind of like a mask Okay, to kind of hide things, which is one thing. And actually, let me show you quickly. So this is why that's useful. You created a nice big list. Okay, you can grab your frame, make it a bit smaller. I know we're jumping ahead in the course, but I guess I want to introduce frames a couple of times. So that's why it's good. You got this list and you can set this to scroll. Okay, so that it kind of clips it off. Same with this. You got the stuff hanging over the edges here. I can say, where are you frame? You can be over there. Then I can say clip contents. So I can use a scroll so people can scroll left and right, but clip off the edges. That's one of the things. Let's jump back. All right, so clip contents is one of the reasons. And um, there are other ones. And the reason I show it to you here is that you're gonna download somebody's free UI template and you're gonna be like, why is everything frames? It's all a bit weird, I don't understand. That's That was my position anyway. So the reason people do do it, they get to an intermediate level or an advanced level in Figma and they just stop using groups, never. Because Figma, um, sorry, frames, is just like groups, but with bonus extra features. And clipping contents is one of them. Let's look at one of the other main ones, just to introduce it now, and we'll work on it at a bit more um, in depth later on. So what we can do is, I'm gonna actually ungroup this. Weird thing about a frame is that you group it, so you group this top one, and then you ungroup it. You frame, you frame it, then you ungroup it. Does that make sense? You ungroup works for both of these. So I'm gonna ungroup it, and you'll notice these guys just come out. I'm gonna put these kind of over here. I'm gonna grab my um, name here, okay? And I'm gonna select all of these and turn them into a frame, not a group, because I wanna see the bonus. The bonus is, watch this, I can click on, double click to go inside our kind of object editing mode. I'm inside my um, frame, and I'm gonna say you stick to the top left of this frame that it's in. This frame is the thing around the outside, Okay, these guys though, I'm gonna click on you. Okay, and I'm gonna say, actually, you are gonna to go to the top, top right. 
Same with you, you can go to the top right. Same with you, top right. And you're like, what does that do? Watch this, if I go now and I'm gonna make a copy of it, and watch this, when I drag it, oh, hey, it sticks to the top right of the frame. Groups can't do that. Okay, they call them constraints. We'll do them properly later on, but when it gets to things like, okay, I need another um, version, it needs to be tablet. Okay, so I'm gonna click on my frame tool, I'm gonna to say, oh, it's gonna be a tablet mini. Okay, it's gonna be in portrait, I'm gonna stick it over here, I'm starting to design. So instead of trying to drag it all out and try and make it all line up, you can click on this guy and go, okay, you go over here, and I can get you in the top, and I can drag this over, and I can stick it to that side. Can you see the perk? It gets more and more in depth when you start kind of stacking things up, and it means when you start adding text, things start reflowing, it gets not complicated, it gets more awesome, that's what it does. But that awesomeness comes at a kind of confusing stage because remember at the beginning of this course, we dragged out frames, remember the frame? That was our mobile phone, we just did it now again with the tablet, okay? So frames get used for the big thing around the outside, but also the little things inside of it, okay? These little nested frames, so I've got a frame inside of a frame, weird. If I bring in, say, remember that icon we brought in earlier? Okay, you probably didn't notice, but if I go to um, our place image, okay, and I bring in the same one or a different one, watch what happens. If I drag this out, you'll notice that actually, can you see, it brought it in as a frame. Okay, it's a frame inside of it is our little vector thing, but it's inside of a frame. So that's why we can't leave it to the end of the course, because there'd be frames everywhere. And you're like, in this case, it doesn't matter. We're not using any sort of this goodness with constraints and variants and all sorts of cool stuff we're going to do later on. It's just kind of like a group, that's all we're gonna use it for for this guy, but know that later on, there's some fancy stuff we can do. Ooh, ooh. So what you're trying to tell me, Dan, is groups bad? Nope, groups are great, and they work just fine, and they just don't have all the extra um, fancy features. So that is my whole point of this video. Um, we're gonna use frames from now on instead of groups, because they have features that we're gonna learn, on, uh, learn later on, uh, and they just appear lots in Figma, and I wondered why. The weird thing is when you've got uh, frames inside of another frame, Weird, why do we got frames inside of frames? And the one last thing is that this frame, why does this one have a name? How did you get that name there and this one doesn't have a name? Basically, if a frame is not nested, it has a name. What I mean by that is, see this frame here, got it selected. If I drag him out over here, watch, his name appears. Inside, his name goes away. So that's kind of why you might ooh, uh, sometimes see a frame name and sometimes the frame is just used as like a group and it's inside of another frame wow what a confusing video dan anyway i let's i hope it got us closer to understanding frames versus groups what we don't need is we don't need these particular examples that we made okay we're going to create some specific icons in a little bit but yeah we're moving towards understanding frames versus groups uh, so delete those and i will see you in the next video Hi everyone, it is class project time. Okay, I want you to create something like this. Okay, you might be following along so far and you might be kind of at similar sort of stage here. If you're not, I want you to build, get all your frames in, okay? I want you to build this first page plus these other three. Basically just other kind of versions of this first page. Rectangles, lines, some text. Okay, I want you to keep it very reasonably similar to my layout, even if you're like, even if you disagree and you're like, no, that shouldn't be there. Keep it kind of similar because I, I, I want you to be able to follow along with your example throughout this course, okay? And these kind of units help me show you all the different features in Figma. So keep it close to that. And the actual requirements for the different class projects are in your exercise files. You'll see something in there called class projects. Open that up and it will look something like this. Okay, we've done this first one, so ignore that now. If you haven't, um, this website URL will change, kind of building it at the moment, but remember you're gonna to go to that website and you're going to create your own brief and persona. So we've done that one already, potentially. And then we're up to here. Okay, so use the skills you've learned so far. It should look something like that. If you're looking for a larger version of it, you should be able to zoom in in this PDF, but if you can't, in your exercise files, there is the PNG, okay? wireframe example, just a nice big version of it you can look at. There is a Figma file in there as well. Remember, if you can't remember how to do the Figma file stuff, you go home, go to your drafts, and hit that, and you can import that Figma file. Up to you. All right, what else needs to be done? Uh, here are the requirements, so four pages. Those are the four pages from our task flow. Okay, uh, pick your own color. 
Okay, it doesn't have to be green, and your own font. You lose points if you use uh, Papyrus, Trajan, Brush Script, or Comic Sans. All terrible fonts. Pick a plain, simple font that I don't hate. It's part of the requirements. I'm looking at you, Papyrus. And then what I want you to do is just take a screenshot. Um, I'll show you how to export frames and stuff properly later on, but it's actually just easier at the moment to go into Figma and open up your project, okay, and just take a screenshot. On a Mac, it's Command Shift 4, okay, and you can just drag a box around it. And on your desktop, you probably have a screenshot. On a PC, it's slightly different. You do use print screen and then you paste it somewhere. Uh, I'm not big on PC and um, exactly how to do it for the different versions. So just Google how to take a screenshot. You're allowed to take a photo with your phone. Either way, do that and then upload it to either the projects or assignments. It depends on the website you're on. You'll have a look. There'll be a way to kind of submit it either as an assignment or a discussion or a project. Once you've done that, I will see you in the next video. Is that big homework? I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't take too long, uh, but it's good. We're going to practice our tools, our techniques, and we're going to get better together, but we need our wireframe. All right, I'll see you in the next video. Hi everyone, let's talk about where to get free icons. I'm not gonna talk specifically about websites, even though I'll give you a couple. It's more about what you're looking for when you are downloading icons for our Figma file. So I'm using iconfinder.com, I like it. There's lots of free stuff on here, good paid stuff as well. But if this website's not here, when you go visit the internet, there's plenty of free icons. Okay, so uh, what you're looking for is, let's say I want the shopping cart icon. Okay, that's what I need for my mock-up here. What you're looking for is a particular file format. It's called an SVG. I'm stalling. <laughs> that thing took ages to load. Anyway, so there's a couple of things on most of the sites. The main thing is all to do with how free it is. Okay, because there's free and then there's properly free. So free or licenses. Um, I'm going to use the one that's for commercial use. Okay, and this one here requires you though to uh, use it for commercially, but you have to link back to them, which is totally fine. You might find good free stuff in there. Um, this one here requires commercial use, but doesn't require a backlink. So I don't actually have to acknowledge the people that made it. So in here, pick anything. I say pick anything. I'm gonna find a shopping cart that looks like a shopping cart. Where is one? <laughs> <laughs> Pick something quickly, Dan. People are watching. All right, this one. All right, so this one here, I'm going to open it up. And what you'll find in most of these sites is there's a PNG version and an SVG version. Let's look at both of them. The PNG is probably the one you already know. SVG, you may or may not know already. So I'm just going to pick a, um, a smaller icon version of this PNG, and I'll show you the difference. So I'm going to download both of them, stick them on my desktop, and this SVG. Let's compare both of them and how Figma deals with both of them. So, um, is there a right one and a wrong one? Yes, SVG is better, but more complicated. But now that we know what frames are and groups are, it's actually not that bad. Okay, so let's bring in a file. I'm gonna do this way, place image. Okay, and let's bring in both of them. You can bring in more than one image at a time. Okay, by holding shift and clicking both of them. Let's click open. Can you see I got like a number a little two there? You can even see my little icon. Look, a little trolley. Okay, so I'm going to click hold shift so that when I drag them out, they are not going all wonky like that. Okay, so hold shift on your keyboard. That's the reason we have a SVG rather than a PNG. I acknowledge that I downloaded a very small version. Okay, on here, in here, you can download like the really big version. Let's download that and it will look fine. Um, so let's bring in another one, command shift K. Okay, I've got this other PNG. The difference is, can you see that size of that one? Okay, so I can get a good quality PNG, but my SVG is one kilobyte. This is 112 kilobytes. That's the reason we don't, you know, we prefer to use SVGs. Uh, so it looks good, but it's ginormous. So can't use your PNG. Uh, it's transparent, which is awesome. This SVG is transparent, kind of. You're like, well, that's not transparent. <laughs> it's got a white background. SVGs into Figma, what they do is, we kind of looked at this earlier, can you see they came in as a frame, okay? Inside of that frame is a group. Inside of that group is a vector. That's all we really want. So I'm just gonna copy it, okay? Come out of that frame and hit paste. I didn't actually come out of that frame. You can drag it out of the frame. So it's just sitting there, no man's land. So I'm gonna click on this thing. I kind of like, that's what I do. 
I don't want it in a frame at the moment. I just want to kind of yank it out and delete that original frame just so I've got the vector sitting, lying around, happy days. Now it's transparent and it is colored. Okay, so I can go through, use my eyedropper tool and actually start using these now, whereas the PNG, we can't change the color. We could, we can go to Photoshop, change it. Okay, but obviously SVG is scalable. That's what the S in SVG is, woohoo. Okay, and yeah, we can go into object editing mode, which you know about already. Okay, if you're like, I love this, but I really want a, uh, double click, start going in. I really want <laughs> a spiky handle then. Okay, uh, <laughs> looks like a digger. Anyway, you get the idea, SVGs are better. So whenever you are looking for icons, free or not free, make sure you get the SVG. All right, another great place to get uh, free stuff is part of the Figma community. So if you go back to your like little house along the top here, there'll be an option uh, somewhere around here called Figma community. It's kind of new, it's better at mine, depending on how long in the future it'll get more and more robust. There is just amazing stuff in here and most of it's free. Okay, so in here you can do things like icons, okay, and you will find loads of great icon sets created by people that we're allowed to use. It's not as searchable as something like Icon Finder if you just want to like a, hey, I need a sharing icon or a social media icon. You have to kind of do a little bit more searching through this, but there is great stuff and it's kind of already in Figma. Okay, so let's have a look. Let's have a look at the fig pick. Okay, uh, fig pick just means Figma has decided this is awesome and everyone should look at it. So what we can do is when we are dealing with the community for Figma, you end up downloading things. Okay, so let's have a little look. Let's kind of, you can go into it to preview it, but eventually at some stage to get all the stuff out of it, you need to do something called duplicating. Okay, so let's click on duplicate and basically you get your own copy saved to your Figma kind of flow. So now let's have a look. Have a look around here. There's two different pages. Ooh, lots of good icons. Okay, and before we actually copy and paste them out, let me show you what happens to these community files or at least anything you've duplicated. Let's go back to home. What you'll notice now in my home, I'm kind of lost. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to my little drop down here, my blurry email address, and I'm gonna say, pick my name. And we get back to kind of home base where we were before. That took a while. <laughs> Yours might do the same, so I'll leave it in there. Okay, um, I was like, have I done something wrong? It eventually loaded. Okay, what happens is it duplicates into your drafts. You'll notice that now I have unicorns. I'm like, you kind of opened it just to grab something out of it, but now it's part of your flow. Okay, you can right click it and delete it, Okay, but everything you open or duplicate in Figma ends in this like, it's part of your world now. That's the kind of benefit, I guess, of working in the cloud, which Figma does. Okay, it's not saved to your hard drive, it's part of your cloud kind of online login stuff. It also means that after a little while, you're gonna have a ton of things open in here and it's gonna be hard to know which is yours. So we'll look at searching and finding the files you want later on and you might be really tidy and actually go delete the ones you don't want anymore. Okay, so we've got a couple of files open. We've got the one we're working on, plus our little unicorns, unicorns, is that unicorns? Anyway, uh, so let's go and have a look. Now, it will depend on how these things are being created. These things are being created as what's gonna be called a component later in this course. So this can be a little bit tricky for us at this level. Okay, so let's just do it anyway. Let's go copy, I really need this. I like it for my wireframe. I'm gonna go back to this document and I'm gonna paste it. And what will end up happening is this weird file turns up with a weird icon. It ends up in our assets folder, okay, used in this file. There it is there. It's a special thing that we're gonna learn later on. For the moment though, what we're gonna do is select it, right click it and say, detach instance. And you're like, I don't know why I'm doing that. Don't worry, we'll learn about it later on, but it means you can just say, it's kind of like ungrouping. Okay, we're gonna say detach the instance. You can see it kind of goes back to that frame and you might decide actually, like we did before, you can keep the frame, that works fine. Or you might go like we did before and like get it out of that frame, drag it out. So it's kind of just hanging out by himself. Or is he there? Let's rename it, let's call it file. And in my case, it's on the, where is it on? It's ended up on a weird page. So let's say that I want it on the checkout page. It's currently not on the checkout page. There we go, haha. -ha. And that is the community. I kind of introduced it earlier on, okay? 
getting into the community because there's so much good stuff in there. You can find good wireframes and good kind of like layouts and lockups and cards and icons. And we're going to get used to copying and pasting them and sticking them into our document and seeing what happens. They come through as components sometimes, sometimes as frames, sometimes they're just groups and they're real easy. But for the moment, I'm just going to tidy up. I don't need these guys. They're kind of an example of what to go get and find. And I will see you in the next video. Now we know what we need when we're getting these free icons. Let's get some icons onto the page ready for our wireframe. Hi everyone, in this video we're going to bring in some icons that I've got in our exercise files. We're going to try and match them so that they look, you know, the stroke widths kind of match this first one. And I'll show you how to replicate them across all our artboards. So yeah, let's dig in. All right, let's bring in some icons and get them all tidied up so that we can use them. Okay, so we're going to use the long way still for the moment, using the little arrow there, place image. Okay, I want one two and three. So I want icon share, user and home. I'm just holding down the command key on a Mac and just clicking them individually. On our PC, it's control. I'm going to open them up. Now what's the key I hold down to make sure they don't go all squiggly? Shift. That's it. So I'm going to get mine to a size. Don't worry about the size at the moment. And I'm going to drag these in. Now what will end up happening is um, the, the size here will depend on the last kind of stroke size that you're working with. So sometimes you might drag in and they might be thick like this or might be super thin. One thing we need to do though is get them all to be very similar. Okay, I've got them kind of a similar-ish sort of size. And um, what I wanna do though is scale them down. Okay, and you've gotta decide here whether you're just gonna use the normal selection tool or our fancy scale tool. Okay, it'll depend on what you wanna do. So in my case, can you see the strokes are kind of staying at that two point. So it's kind of getting, if I get them down to about there, <laughs> they're kind of close. Or you can use the scale tool, okay, and just scale them down. They all go down and we can adjust them afterwards. I want them down to about a size-ish and get them into that position. So import them, get them down to kind of this position and we're gonna try and match these now. Now, you gotta decide whether I'm twirling all these up. These are frames, just like groups with stuff in them. If you're happy to work like this now, we'll just leave them there. You can pull these out and delete the frames. Okay, what I'm gonna do is leave them. So my share icon in here with it selected, you can see in here, I need to go inside of it because I wanna click on this thing, came in with a group inside of it. But with it selected, actually I can go in here and I can see the stroke color. In my case, I don't need to change it because it's matching what else I've got. Um, and But the stroke width is about two. That's what I used here and I wanna try and match these all. Okay, so same with this one. Um, sometimes so I can't see the stroke yet, so I need to go inside the frame and click on both of these. I'm holding shift to select both of them and it's scaled down to like 0.5, you can see there. So I'm gonna just type in two. This one here, this is not a terrible thing, but the way this has been drawn is that it's not a nice little stroke. It's actually a fill. If I double click it into go to editing mode, it's not like lines that are on top of each other. If you're an illustrator person from way back, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, if you're not and kind of new to this vector world, you will just find some of them that are made up of strokes. And this one is actually made up of a fill, okay? And makes it a little bit harder to adjust. So for this one, to make it thinner, I literally have to go and do stuff like this, which is no fun at all. <laughs> so you might just download a different one or just draw one. We're gonna draw, you could easily redraw that with the line tool. Okay, so I'm gonna undo. Double click to get out. And scale wise, these probably need to come down a little bit. And this is where I don't want to be using my scale. Okay, if I use scale now and scale it down to the right size, it might look like this one here. But if I go inside of it, double click, you can see it's no longer two, it's 1.8. That can catch you out. Probably nobody's gonna notice, but I notice, you'll notice. So we're just gonna use the selection tool to do the scaling. And it means that holding shift, it means it'll retain being, uh, uh, two point stroke. You get what I mean? Oh, broke that. I'm gonna leave it. <laughs> it's broken forever. Okay, I can't live with it. Wait there. All right, back. Um, so what we're gonna do now is get those three in, get them kind of looking the same. I feel like this one maybe is not looking exactly the same. Don't spend too long on that, Dan. This is just a wireframe. Uh, what I want to do is I want to show you another, not trick, but a, a useful thing in Figma is I'm gonna delete these, okay? Because what I wanna do is have that on all of them. So 
What I'm gonna do is copy it, okay? So from this first one, click on the name of product details and just hit paste. So I'm using control C and V on a Mac. You'll use, con ooh, that's a PC. So PC uses control C and V and a Mac uses command C and a V. So you just command V on all of these and gets it back exactly where it got it off that first uh, frame, which is cool. So do that, I'm not gonna spend too long getting all the spacing perfect on this because we're gonna have to go and test this on a phone because like, are they too big on a phone? Probably. Are they far enough apart? Probably not. Okay, my big old fat fingers is gonna end up touching more than one icon. So we'll do that when we actually test on our phone. But we've found our icons, we've got them in there, we've got them looking kind of the same. That'll be good for now. Let's get into the next video. Hi everyone, in this video, we're gonna look at some of the secret sauce, what makes Figma amazing, and it is the plugins that are run in parallel with Figma. So plugins are made by other people, not Figma, okay? And basically you install them, okay? And in this case, I've installed a little icon plugin, and let's say we search for a house, I can grab my icon and just drag it out. So it is a way of He's a bit teeny tiny there, but you get the idea. This is a way of extending Figma. There are lots of plugins and they are amazing. We'll focus on the icon one at the moment, but they all work roughly the same sort of way. They extend what Figma can do. Let's jump in and look at at least one of them. So to install our first plugin, if you go to uh, this little drop down next to the Figma icon, you can go to plugins and we're gonna browse them in the community. Okay, manage just will be able to see the ones you've already got installed and maybe uninstall them. I'm gonna to go to browse in the community. Often I don't use this method. I just go to this home screen. Okay, and remember under community, we were looking at icons a second ago. There's another option here, it says plugins. So this is kind of new and always getting developed. What I'd like you to do is, plugins are just so an amazing part of Figma that just spend, like take a break, Take, uh, you know, take five minutes and just have a read through all the amazing plugins, okay? Um, there's just so much in here that can get you so far and kind of enable you to be fast and efficient and like visually <laughs> really compelling. Okay, so have a look through all the different plugins. We're gonna look at icons for the moment. What you need to do is, well, the way that I use to gauge whether this plugin is good is mainly bound to installs. There's no like star rating yet, which I wish there was, but like Unsplash, which is a way of getting kind of commercial free images is a really cool plugin, really common, probably the first one everybody installs. We'll do it later in the course, but you can see 60, uh, 630,000 other UX designers decided it was useful. So there must be some big in here. We're gonna use Iconify, okay? Uh, if this one is not in here or hasn't been updated for the last three years, okay, you'll find another version that will work similar. This video is not actually how to use Iconify, but just like how to install a plugin and get it working. So we're gonna click install. Yes, please. Remember these aren't made by Figma, so no responsibility taken. Okay, and let's go and have a look now of how to actually operate a plugin. We'll do a few through this course. So let's have a look. So you have to turn the plug on, plugin on. You can only have one running at a time. So you gotta say, I want plugin called Iconify to start working. Now this is where they all vary. Most of them have some sort of UI. They all look different. <laughs> None of them look the same. This one here, it's big. I put mine on the other screen. But I'm just gonna move it over here. Let's have a look. So let's have a look at that shopping one we're looking for. Maybe let's look at another house. Maybe that house was broken. It was hard to change it. So in here, let's have a look at the houses. Is that gonna be a stroke? None of them are gonna be strokes, I bet you. Maybe that guy will, and maybe that guy will be. Probably not, I'm gonna use this one, fingers crossed. So you can just click and drag them out. Look at that, got a giant SVG icon. And really that's it, that is that plugin. You can just drag stuff out. You, obviously there's other options in here. Okay, you can search icons and there's lots of tagging and stuff going on. So plugins all work a similar sort of way. There's some sort of UI and you'll be able to click and drag things out. We'll do a few more throughout the course. But yeah, that is the plugin specifically for icons. I don't need this guy now, so I'm just gonna delete him. Now when you are deleting bits and pieces, it's probably, because you're always gonna be left with a frame, so try not to like, you can, you can just delete it. But you know, with this frame, it's best to go into your actual layers and say, that's it, I'm gonna hit delete, and everything inside of it. 
and then just make sure your layers are kept nice and tidy. The hang is that? <laughs> what are you doing down there? I have no idea how I got that one. Anyway, keep it clean. Select that guy too. All right. That is, yeah, a really simple plugin. Plugins are amazing in Figma. We're going to learn a few more throughout the course. Let's get into the next video. Hi everyone, it is class project time, not homework. Uh, we are going to be doing something around icons. Okay, so if you haven't already, I want you to go and make sure that uh, you add the three icons along the top that we've kind of done in the class. And then on your own, I want you to add uh, this section down the bottom here. Okay, on the confirmation page, just a, you know, like a, a prompt to ask people to share their purchase. And when they click on this, it'll pre-fill out their Facebook page or their Twitter tweet about, hey, I just bought these great headphones. Check them out here at this link. Okay, so and when you are doing this, you're going to kind of start... Uh, dabbling with our persona okay so in my case um, uh, Sarah here she's in her late 20s so I feel like I can be a little bit mm, not as explicit with my language okay because if somebody else maybe is a little less technologically savvy born in a different decade um, they might need a bit more explicit click this button to you know upload to your social media and to share with your friends your you know what you have purchased it might have to be a bit more deliberate so my persona she's in her late 20s so she she gets the gag or the joke or the inference okay without being too explicit also she these are the social media icons that i feel i'm not going to put them all there don't you hate sites that just have like here's the 40 different um social media platforms that you might share on it and you know i've excluded a bunch because i feel like her age group um what else like She's working for herself, so probably has a LinkedIn um, profile, and it's not going to be corporate, so she's probably going to be okay sharing her new headphones um, uh, purchase. And everyone's using Facebook still. Uh, so, like, use these sorts of, you know, what should I have here? Go back to your persona, decide what's going to be in there. It might be wrong, like, you know, I might have got these totally wrong, and my client's going to come back and go, why isn't there Reddit there or some other thing that's new and TikTok-y thing? Okay, but this is something that I feel like it's worth testing. We might add more to these later on, and hopefully in our user testing, there will be some feedback like, hey, where is uh, that thing that I don't even know about? Why isn't that there? All right, so that is it. So the top navs, I want you to find the icons from, um, I don't want you to draw them, I want you to find existing ones from either a free site, just to practice the SVG stuff, and or a plugin. Install your plugin, get it working, see if you can get stuff out. There's a little bit of text there that goes on there. Choose the appropriate icons, we've talked about that. Add them to the confirmation page, take a screenshot and upload it to the assignments, projects, comments, uh, and that's an example. And actually, before you go, if you are using plugins, which I think you should, get it installed, have a go with it. It doesn't have to be Iconify, use something else. Um, sometimes when you are dragging uh, things from plugins, let's say, it depends on the size of them. Like, let's say I drag in this Facebook one. Sometimes you're like, giant F, okay? And it just makes everything really tough in terms of your layers when you're new. So I'm gonna undo that. Often it can be undo. Okay, it's just easier just to find an empty part of your artboard and just drag it off there. Because then they're on their own, in their own little kind of frame. Okay, and I can drag off a bunch of these. Where are they? And what else we got? Okay, I can drag up a bunch of these and I can scale them down and get them appropriate and then bring them in rather than trying to push them around in there and they ended up in inside of groups or frames that they shouldn't be. That's my advice. When you're finished with the plugin, close it down. You guys are gone. And yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Hiya, in this video we're going to look at pages. That sounds boring. It is and it isn't. Um, over here at the moment we're going to end up creating a page. We've currently got a page one. We're going to rename it mobile. We're going to create a second page that's going to have our desktop frames on it. And then we're going to create another page that has our... Uh, brief and our persona and also our task flow all in one kind of nice figure document but these pages are going to be nice and separated out so let's jump in and learn how to make them all right so to start off you've already got a page one uh, it's lurking there it's kind of probably closed up you're on your layers panel you've got page one there it is you can get quite far in figma and never have more than page one 
Okay, on page one is all of the stuff we've made so far. So we've got, I'm gonna use these little chevrons here to close them down just to make everything look tidier. Okay, so we've got our confirmation page, check out product details. You can rearrange these, because that doesn't make sense, does it? Confirmation at the end. Ah, oh, I don't know. <laughs> ah, that feels better anyway. So we've got our frames, which you could argue are pages. Okay, they call more like artboards, but we call them frames because that's what Figma calls them. Pages are a way of separating this kind of artboard here. So page one, you can have more than one page, a page two, and basically you get to here and you go, okay, I'm gonna start making something different. Why would you have two pages? In our case, what we might do, page one might be, I'm gonna double click it and call it mobile. Okay, and this other one is going to be desktop. So I want you to do that because we will design a mobile version and a desktop version in this course. There should be a tablet version as well. We're not gonna design it because mm, we're not. <laughs> it's just a small bit in between. Uh, so we've got our mobile and desktop. Let me show you some other examples of it. Well, you've got a desktop. Let's, before we go, go to our frame tool. Now your frame tool, again, I'm not trying to get too many shortcuts, but the F key is a pretty common one. Okay, over here, I'm gonna say I want desktop and Depending on when in the future you're watching this, this is a really good generic size, um, 1440 by 1024. Okay, um, we're gonna have one, two, three, or four of these. So I'm gonna drag one out. Don't do that, go to your move tool. Okay, grab the name, hold down the option key on a Mac, or key on a PC. Hold shift as well if, you, if it's not locking into place, it totally is. And then command D or control D a couple of times. I love that command D, so satisfying. Um, so we've got three of them. Okay, go through, I'll speed this up. I'm gonna name them all exactly like my mobile one. I totally can't remember, so I'm gonna have to flick back and forth. Please hold. Yep, that was a painful copy and paste. <laughs> Okay, so that's a good use of pages. There's no reason why you can't just have them underneath here, but you will see before you get too far, they end up looking like this. Uh, let's have a look. That is my mobile one later in this course. Just stuff ends up everywhere. And <laughs> it's not pretty, okay? But it's truthful or honest. It's an honest file, that's what that is. So other use cases uh, is, we're gonna do it in this version as well, is often you'll put another page with things like your task flow and persona. We'll do that in a second. Okay, you also, let's have a look. I'll show you now because you'll have opened up some of the stuff from the community. Remember we looked at these um, uh, un-icons, uni-icons, whatever they are. Okay, over here, I, maybe I flicked through it. Maybe I didn't, I can't remember. But you might have noticed that I kind of might have gone to layers and I might have popped that down because I'm like, oh, there's pages and there's cover and there's unicorns. I want to say unicorn so bad, okay? And that's how I found it. These are different pages within this one. This one here is just acting as a cover or a thumbnail, okay? And there's where all the good stuff is. It gets even more hardcore. Let's look at something a bit more big, okay? I'm at the home. I'm over here at community and I'm at explore. I'm going to find the, find anyone. Let's try this one. So Microsoft Teams is liable to be massive. Let's open it up. It's gonna be big if you've got a slow internet connection and it's a big kit, okay, or a big Figma file, it might take a long time to up to download. Mine's, I've got kind of rural broadband. <laughs> it goes okay, it's on a mobile device, so mm, that's, that's okay. Okay, what you'll find is, can you see in this one, is you might get to here and go, that's not that useful, where's all the rest of it? It's in here, where all the pages are, okay, and you'll notice that there's a cover page, great. Um, general information, okay, they've created a page with nothing on it just to make it easy over here. Can you see this one doesn't do anything. This one here uh, is where we get started. There's a bit of documentation on it, resources, what else, things to download. So you can see there's quite a complex one. The change log, let's have a look at, I bet you there's more here. Look how many pages this one has, loads. Okay, let's peek at a bit of them. The layouts, the avatars, the icons. So, um, you know, at the end of this course, we're not gonna be creating a full, this would be called a design system. It's called a UI kit. UI kit's understating what this thing does. This is a system, okay, for how to think about everything about Microsoft Teams. So somebody's made this, 
somebody at Microsoft, okay, and they've separated it out so that me as a designer, if I'm a junior designer, I come in here and I go, all right, I've got to make this um, pop-up window that communicates that I've lost all your files and I'm really sorry. Okay, you can go through here, find, read the guidelines, understand fonts, how they're communicating with different fonts on different platforms, spacing, what colors they are allowed to use, what the colors communicate. So this is a full design system. Later on in the course, we'll make a teeny tiny design system, normally called like a style guide. Um, but this is, this is a pretty big use case. But I guess I wanted to just do pages because you're gonna have to file through these. I'm gonna make mine up again. Every page, see in this case, has a bunch of frames in it. Inside these frames, a bunch of other frames and artboards and all sorts of good stuff. So that's what pages are for. Other use cases might be that you have, like say you got mobile, there might be uh, option one, okay? It might have a specific kind of task flow and you do another mobile option two with a different task flow or different colors or a different look and feel, concept one, concept two. You get the idea. You can use pages to separate it out. I'm gonna get rid of that. What I want you to do though is have a third page and this one's going to be our brief and task flow. Okay, so it's great to have all this stuff together. Um, so it's gonna be at the top. Okay, and in here I want you to bring in the screenshot or the JPEG or however you got your persona earlier on in the course. Okay, I got mine here. So I'm gonna copy and paste this. Yours will be slightly different. I'm kind of building this functionality for you. But earlier in the course, I would have shown you how to uh, create your own persona. And I want you to grab it, the screenshot or the JPEG that you've downloaded and put it onto your brief and task flow. Okay, so we'll put it in here. Yours is probably just a big JPEG. I'm not gonna resize mine. And I'm gonna bring in that task flow. Uh, if you remember from earlier, if you've opened up the task flow, it should be under your uh, little home button, under your name, and where is that task flow? There it is there, task flow. If you haven't opened it, remember, go back there, go to your name, go to drafts, go to import, and the task flow is in your exercise files. There it is there. Open that up, and I just want you to copy and paste it in here. It's just handy to have all your documents, copy, I'm gonna close it down, go back to our initial, the one we're working on together, and I put that over there. So my task flow and my brief all in one place so that I can refer back to it easily and we learn what pages do. Simple. All right, do those things and I will see you in the next video. Hi everyone, in this video we're gonna prototype, we're gonna put it in a phone and when we click stuff, it moves through to the next frame. Cool, huh? I'm also gonna get a little bit lost a little bit into this video. Something goes wrong, we're gonna fix it together so we all learn, let's get started. Okay, it's exciting time. Uh, how do we prototype it? We'll do some basic stuff first. What we need to do first of all is go from design, which we've been at for a long time now, go to prototype. Okay, and what we're gonna do is have the home page selected. Okay, we'll start with this one. And what you'll notice is this little dot. This little dot is important. We're gonna click, hold, and drag, 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 like a little arrow, and go book <laughs> and stick them on there. Uh, give it a play. You can just kind of click it and then let go. Now, that's it. It's gonna do some basic stuff to start with. We'll do the other pages. It's the same with this one. Click on the name at the top and say you. Click the name at the top of this one. And there you go. All right, let's prototype it. Okay, to prototyping it, it's called present. Can you see it here, the little play button? Click on that and it will open up. You'll notice another tab. There's our original. We've gone off to this other tab. Okay, and what happens is it'll present from whatever page you were on. So that's not what I want. I wanna go back here and if I go to this home page here, okay, just click on the word home page and then present. Okay, it'll basically jump back to that same tab, but at least we're at the home page now. Look at that. That's our sweet home page. So what we're gonna do is just click anywhere. Okay, so click once. Ooh, and it moved along. Click again. Check out page. <laughs> what is that? Confirmation page has had a bad day. What is on there that is doing that? Shouldn't do that. <laughs> uh, let's close it down slide again. Uh, what is on there? Nothing. Something's weird happening. Uh, I'll leave it in the course in case it happens to you. Home page. Present. Yours is probably gonna have this little load screen as well. There we go, you, you, you. Giant something in the way. I'll figure that out later on, but it's kind of working. <laughs> We're gonna ignore the giant 
black box. Uh, Yaki, you wait there and I'll figure it out so we all know. Wait there. All right, I'm back. I have no idea is the answer. <laughs> Did you, you already sort it in fast mode. Basically what I normally do in a situation like that is I will start, um, I'll start going through and deleting stuff. I figured it was some SVG doing some weird stuff. So I delete that and I tested it and it still was broken. Let's double check it's still broken. No, it's fixed. Weird. <laughs> I don't know then. Um, so. All I did was delete it and then undo it and it came back to life. So just in case um, something else happens and it's not as easily fixed, like that took me ages. It took me about five, 10 minutes to kind of figure out what was going on. What I normally do is actually I go through and I just delete stuff and then test it, delete stuff and test it, delete stuff and test it. And to see eventually something that I've deleted kind of shows that it was causing the problems. That's normally how I do it. And then I gave up on that. So I just made another version of it and that worked. And in this case, I just deleted it and undid it and it came back. Probably closing the program, opening it back up, restarting the machine. Anyway, all right, that was a little bit of a um, tangent, but these things happen. So it kind of worked. Let's go to our present now. Forget, this is back in the zone, Dan, back in the zone. Okay, so we're gonna preview it and we have done some basic prototyping where you click anywhere and it moves along. Okay, it gets to the end and it's kind of stuck. So what you can do, if you kind of wiggle around, okay, you'll notice that um, after a while, some other little options appear. Okay, restart, which is R, it's a really common one. Get back to the beginning. So you can kind of work through your prototype again. You can manually get through it. Can you see down here? Page one, two, three, four. Other things that might be useful is under these options here, you might just you want to go like 100% or full screen to get rid of all the kind of chrome around the outside. Uh, what else will you want to do? That's kind of it. And um, one thing you need to know is that you don't need to close this every time. Okay, you I don't know, feel like when you're finished, you close this down and then come back over here. But you don't have to leave it open and just always go back to it. Because what happens is it updates. See this, if I go in here and I decide to uh, change the color of this. Oh, good point. This happens quite a bit when you're new and you're like, where did it all go? Okay, because you're on prototype, remember to go back to the design. There's three up the top here. We'll look at inspect later in the course, but Whenever you're missing your colors or fonts, it's because you're stuck on prototype, not design. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna say, you are now going to be another color. Okay, now I'm gonna jump out to this tab that's still open and you'll notice uh, if I go back through my pages, it updates. If you're using the browser version, it's handy to get this tab, pull it out and put it on another desktop. On the desktop version, it's kind of stuck in here at the moment. I can't kind of pull it apart. So just toggle back between the two. If you do want to toggle back between the two, the shortcut is, there's no shortcut. That is a bit of a pain. There might be in the future, check. You want to Google the thing that says uh, Figma present, uh, what is it called? Yeah, present shortcut, okay? It doesn't exist at the moment. What we do is we use the command on a Mac, control on a PC, and command one is back to your little home screen. Okay, we've been clicking on that. Command two is whatever the second tab is. That's considered the first one, two, three. So in my case, I'm gonna be going back between command two and command three. Command two, command three, command two. Make a change, command three. Okay, and it updates instantly. So you can keep that open. Another thing to note is you can't prototype across pages. Okay, so I go to my homepage, I go to prototype, and I'm like, I wanna to go to page something over here. That's not possible. Okay, so it's only between frames on a page. What you'll notice in mine as well is that I have this nice chrome around the outside of an iPhone 8. That might look ancient when you're watching this, okay, but you can change that. And let's, let me show you how. So let's be on prototype. Let's go to show prototype settings or have nothing selected. You end up at the same place. Okay, so having something selected, prototype, click this button or just click in no man's land. 
Okay, and you can say, all right, I don't want an iPhone 6. I want, uh, I don't know what Google Pixel, like I own a 4 at the moment. Why, why can't we have a 4? <laughs> you have to look at a really old uh, 2. Um, and you can pick through the different colors. Um, <laughs> not that they change much on an iPhone, but obviously on uh, iPhone 8. Okay, instead of the gold one, you can pick the space gray one or the silver one. It's basically the backs of the phone, so not a whole lot changes. You can change the background color. You can go from portrait to landscape. Okay, and when I go into preview now, let's have a look. Hey, doesn't quite work on landscape, but you get the idea. If you can't see any of these, it's because when you started, okay, remember way back in the beginning when we went, all right, make our first frame, and we picked one of these defaults, okay, they're attached to this. Okay, so if, even if you've just typed out, you've started with a desktop version and you've typed it out and made it a phone size, it doesn't connect up anymore. So you might have to make phone sizes and copy and paste them on if you want that uh, Chrome there. It's It doesn't help the testing very much other than it looks cool. You'll also notice that our desktop versions, so let's have a look, desktop, click on this one, even though there's nothing on this. So I'll click on home page. I'm on the frame too, aren't I? Okay, click on the home page. You'll notice in prototype, prototype settings, there's nothing in here. Okay, so I can go and say that I want it to be a desktop, okay, like a laptop, and it's not there. Okay, so there's only a few things you can actually wrap that Chrome around at the moment. All right, one last thing before we go is if you have been following me, what I want you to do is go back to mobile and I want you to break all of the um, these prototypes here because I don't want to just click anywhere. I want it to go to product details only when I click the learn more button. And I want to go straight from buy now all the way to the checkout page when that button's clicked. At the moment, it's using the entire frame. So to get rid of it, you can do two things. Uh, what I tend to do is just click on the little arrow, hit delete. Or you can click on your frame here, okay, and say under prototype, can you see it says we've we've applied this interaction called tap checkout. Okay, just hit minus. It's the same thing whether you want to delete it by selecting it and deleting it, or selecting the frame and then just minusing any interactions you've got added. All right, so we're back. We've gone nowhere. We added them, but we deleted them. Let's jump into the next video and we will rig up the buttons, but we'll also add some animations with our transitions. All right, I'll see you there. Hey everyone, in this video, we are going to rig up this prototype so the buttons go to places, not just clicking the frame. Plus, we'll look at the different animation techniques in between the frames. Actually, I'll show you. Okay, bye now does a cool pushy thing. This one does a slidey thing. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna show you those. I'll also show you, the, remember that problem we had on this last uh, frame, the big giant black boxes? That came back and we fix it right at the beginning here. So I'll leave that in there so we can all learn. We'll learn about easing as well. It's a teeny bit of a long one, but we cover a lot. All right, let's jump in. All right, to change the animations, we're gonna do a couple of things. We are going to uh, make sure we're on prototype here in the top right. Okay, and we're going to delete these. Okay, if you haven't already, okay, click on the names at the top and delete these transitions. Ooh, where did he come from? Ha ha! <laughs> Do you remember in an early video you were like, <laughs> I was like, what were those big black uh, boxes? I've turned Figma off, opened it back up, and I totally figured out what those big squares were. Okay, there's something in here. Uh, yeah, that's what they were. Big giant letters. Facebook, and there we go. Oh, well, problem solved. Uh, I think I was demoing it with you guys, showing you how to drag it in, and they all ended up there, but they disappeared. And now they're back. Oh, well, we fixed that uh, problem. Uh, let's look at the animation. So we've deleted the connections between them all. Okay, and let's do it for actual specific buttons rather than the whole entire frame. So what we can do is we're gonna say the buy now, okay, gives its own little dot. Every little unit has a dot, so you can make everything clickable. So I want this buy now button to go to, it's gonna skip our product details and go all the way over to this one. Can you see I'm just dragging it around and you can connect it up. I want it to go to straight to checkout. Okay, that's for the keen buyers to go straight there, no fuss, no mess. Now, the animation is this, okay? Uh, it is instant at the moment, just moves across. Let's look at dissolve, and let's just go and test it. Remember, you don't have to reload this, um, uh, but you might, if you've closed it, 
Okay, just go to this little play button. Okay, and go to present, and it will open it up. All right, so our little button, gonna click it. Look at that, dissolve. Very exciting. Remember, R is the refresh button, and you can practice through it. So we won't cover every single one because some of them are pretty self-explanatory. Um, we're going to instant is easy, dissolve, as you just saw. Smart Animate will leave for this video because it's a little bit more complicated for later in the course. It is amazing, but we're going to do it later on. You need to set it up a bit more. Um, let's play with move in. Let's have a look. Uh, R for reset. Move in. You see it slides in from the side. That's pretty cool. That gets really nice when you're doing kind of like mobile navigation. You want to kind of like move in from the side or maybe images flying across. Um, instead of testing every single one, what you can do is like move out. And can you see down the bottom here? If you hover above it, it kind of gives you a visual cue of what it's going to do. So push. Can you see instead of moving, which is one f kind of sliding in on top, push. We'll push one out to move one in. Okay, so this is kind of an easy way to um, slide's really good when we do get to those mobile apps where it just kind of like pushes it to the side, not all the way in. Okay, I'm going to stick to move in. And can you see here the directions? You can decide if where you want it from the left or come in from the right, down from the bottom. <laughs> down from the top <laughs> and up from the bottom. Uh, so those are all pretty easy. And um, let's look at one of the other interesting things is easing. Okay, so easing is on by default and it just means that ease out means it's gonna start fast and go slow on the out. Okay, it's gonna ease out it's that little curve there. Okay, I'll exaggerate it here. So um, this is another term we need to learn, um, MS, which is milliseconds. Okay, 300 milliseconds is there's a thousand milliseconds in a second. So that is one second. Okay, so uh, 300 is, I don't know, a small part of it. Um, Third-ish. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm gonna turn it up to a second just so that I can um, preview it and have a look. Um, so let's go over here. It's R for refresh, by now. Can you see, nice and slow. But it starts fast and then gets nice and slow at the end. Okay, so that's ease out. What's very often nice is both ease in and out. You can ease it in, so it goes slow at the beginning. Watch the little, can you see? This actually shows it even better in this little um, icon here. So it starts slow, 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 and gets faster. Okay, it just always looks good with that ease in and ease out. Okay, so I'm gonna crank it right up to exaggerate it to 200 milliseconds, okay. Oh, I can do that. That's one fifth of a second. <laughs> um, all right, so let's preview it. Let's have a look uh, for a reset. By now, that is too fast. <laughs> uh, so let's try three, let's try 400. Reset, click it. Still probably a little fast, but you get the idea, right? It's easing is to play with the animation. Um, ease in and out is pretty cool. It's kind of like a bounce. So let's have a little look. It's probably still going a bit fast. Let's have a look. Yeah, too fast, but cool. Let's make it go to um, push in. Yeah, that's it. Push in, I'm gonna ease it in and out, and I'm gonna turn it to 600. There's a lot of playing with this. It depends on how long it is, and what kind of easing you're doing, what kind of direction it has to move, kind of how far it has to move. So alpha reset. So that kind of E, what was it called? Um, Ease in and out is that kind of bounce option. Before we go, we're gonna kind of rig it up a little bit. You do this on your example as well. I'm not gonna do it as a class exercise because I can't really check it. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just follow me. We wanna go from learn more. You could do it from the text. It's better to do it from the button. You could group it and do it from both. Okay, so I'm just gonna do it from the um, button around the outside. Okay, and I'm gonna say learn more is going to our product details. So you can learn more about it. Um, we're going to do the uh, text over here. So. When you often click a heading on a website, okay, it'll go back to the home page. This is my home page, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say you go to this one. This go to this one. Now, what animation is it using? It's gonna use whatever the last thing you used. So I'm using a lot of pushes. Okay, so if you don't like push, we're gonna have to go and change them all. <laughs> so pick it first before you start clicking on them. Okay, so it'll just remember the last one. Uh, so I'm sticking to push. Um, the other thing to note about animation and just the interactions in general and prototyping. If I copy this and delete this one, click on there, hit paste. Can you see it brought along with it? 
Okay, so as long as you're in prototype mode, you can copy and paste to different ones. So it means you can rig up the entire um, navigation on one of them and just copy and paste it along. Okay, so let's say it's this one here. I want it to go to the home page. You know, I make this go to the home page. I don't have a share and a um, uh, account button yet. Okay, or even a mobile nav yet, but I could just copy them all and paste them on and everything just to save some time. So by now, you end up with a spaghetti. It gets more and more spaghetti-ish depending on how detailed you want your kind of prototype to be. What I want to do is make sure that this purchase button goes to here. Boop. And my home button's going, home button's going. Um, you don't have to drag it. Um, after a while, like it's really easy with only four of them because you can just kind of like oh, zoom out and just quickly drag this one, get it over here. Okay, it's doable. Uh, after a while, it's not, you know. <laughs> you saw that like Microsoft Materials one. Uh, no, Microsoft Teams one. There's no chance of rigging that up um, with dragging and dropping. Okay, so what you can do is you can click on these. Okay, and actually don't click on them. You select it in prototype mode, click interactions, hit plus. Okay, and it's going to say tap. What happens when the, when you tap this one? It's going to go to navigate to the home page. Okay, so you can do it that way and play around with your dissolve. So instead of dragging it, you can just kind of like select it, add this interaction, and do it this way. I'm going to dissolve back. Fancy. Okay, I think that's it. Um, that's it. That's it. That's it. Hang on, let me think. I'll pause it. Hang on. Uh, it's hard to get it right anyway when you're in the desktop view. In our upcoming video, we will test it on our actual phone. And then you'll know instantly. You'll be like, I'm stuck <laughs> and I can't get back. Okay, so you can update your um, uh, your prototype. Oh, updating them. We didn't do that. So if I want to update this one from you know push, you can click on this line and it will pop that out. Otherwise, <laughs> click on it and then you can click on homepage and it just pops that thing back out again. To delete one, you can drag it off and back into itself so it disappears, or you can uh, click on the line like we did before and delete it. All right, we're starting to get prototypey. Let's have a look at our prototype. What can we do? Uh, let's go back to home. And um, did you notice that if I click on somewhere that doesn't work, these little blue dots appear? It's just to help uh, people that are testing, even yourself, what to actually click. Okay, because we are doing, let's say, a task flow, and it's very simple. There's only four slides in it. And I only want to test that. I don't want people going, I'd probably remove that plus button for my test just because it's going to confuse the test itself. Okay, but um, maybe it goes to the um, uh, product details page. But if you click anywhere, it should highlight the one. So by now, uh, purchase. Hey, congratulations. The push and the bounce is a bit weird, but um, you get the idea. All right, that is animation. What you probably are thinking, you're thinking is, I'm not sure I can use uh, Figma because it doesn't have the best, most amazing animation transition in the world. Let's have a look. It doesn't have, dissolve. Where's my page peel and my barn doors? I know, they're actually illegal in most countries now because they're so terrible. Uh, so for your viewing pleasure, editor, can we wrap up with a page peel? Hello, uh, this is the other side of my office. You're normally looking from that way, or across this way. This is, that way it looks like. It's my junk and my soundboards to try and make it sound nice. Uh, and it's nighttime, it's not kind of moody, it's just actually dark. Uh, it's about 11 o'clock at night, and we're making courses for us. Um, and in this video, we are gonna be looking at something called Figma Mirror. What is it? It's a way of testing our, you know, we're on the computer trying to design a phone website, a mobile first website. Okay, or an app, okay, there's no point spending all your time on there. You need to be testing it on the device, that thing. Okay, so there is an app you can download from either the Android or the um, Mac App Store. You can tell I don't use it. Um, but it's called Figma Mirror. They might be changing that name. Um, check in the comments if they have updated it, but it's called Figma Mirror. You sign in with your Figma username and password, then somehow magically it just starts happening. You don't have to be on the same network, Magic. Um, and basically what happens is, uh, can I show you here? Um, I'll show you, can you zoom in on that? You kinda can. Basically if I click on different things here on my desktop, you, can, you can't see what I'm doing over here, but if I click on my details page, where is it, details page, there it is. Click on my checkout. 
So it's kind of live updating. And even better, it's actually live um, interacting. So, will this work? Maybe. So, click on my home button. What can you see? Home button. Home button's too small because I can barely click on it. You can't see what I'm doing. Buy now button. Look at that. Okay. Uh, purchases. What is it focusing on? Is it focusing on the right thing? Maybe. Fades. Oh, look how good this is. So I can actually work on it. And the big thing I'm going to show you is the buy now button's too small. The text looks fine on desktop, but it's teeny tiny in there. Okay. The purchase button looks all good when I go to buy now. Um, how is this filming the cam? This is probably terrible, but... Hey, that purchase button feels good to me. I'm finding it very hard to click on the buttons along the nav as well. They just need to be, they don't need to be bigger. They need to be smaller with a bigger area around them. So a frame to make them bigger. Logo is too small. Text on the purchase page is good. The checkout page. Um, and I do get stuck on the learn more page. I don't have any sort of like prototyping off the, <laughs> uh, the, um, more de product details page. I forgot to add it. You probably saw it in the last video, but it's when you get to this kind of stage and you're like testing it on your own, you're like, ah, oh, forgot that bit. Or that's way too small. Or that's a hideous color. Green. Okay, so um, actually that's probably pretty good. Um, oh, one, let's do a live update because that's pretty cool. I'll, I'll adjust the zoom so we can do it a little bit better. You wait there, I'm gonna change the camera. All right, so probably should have done this at the beginning. Uh, watch this, it live updates. I'm moving stuff around on my desktop. So you're looking at my laptop there, my phone over there. <laughs> um, and yeah, you can just kind of work. So you, when I'm working, especially at this initial stage, getting font sizes and stuff ready, uh, I just kind of like, I don't have it propped up. I just have my phone lying down on the ground. Uh, but so you can see it. Um, this is really handy now. I can go through and say, actually font size here, what do I want to do? It's a group, so I'm going to go into my group. And I'm going to use up and down until I find something. What I'm looking at is I am keeping my eye out on my phone here. Okay, that's what I'm looking at. I'm like, is that an approachable for, uh, size? What you'll find is pretty much always 16 is good. Okay, you can't see it because it's on this side of my uh, desktop, but I've gone to 16 points. That generally is a no brainer good one. Okay, can't wreck it. 15 if you're trying to be cool and fancy and trying to keep it small. But if you get down around the 12s and 13 points, it becomes quite a tricky thing to, it's fine for some things, but for a big old click now buy button, it feels a bit small. So I wanna go through and let's make this a bit bigger. Move them across, let's center them together. I'm going to have to do the same for the uh, learn more button. It's hard doing it one handed. I need my hands over here, but I don't want my hairy knuckles in the video. But you get the idea. You can make changes really quickly, be seeing what it looks like on a phone. Okay. It's pretty much instantaneous. I'm, I don't know. I'm pretty amazed by how that works. So yes, if you're designing for tablet, have a tablet. If you're designing for desktop, it's a bit easier because you can just do it on your desktop. But mobile phone or an app, okay, or a mobile first website like we're doing, okay, desktop is part of our plan, but it's secondary. Most of our audience is going to be coming from uh, paid ads because I talked to the client about it. Those are the kind of conversations you talk about as well, like lead generation, where is it all coming from? It's coming from Facebook ads. It's all going to come from mobile phones. If it's coming from YouTube how-to videos like a lot of my courses do, then it's desktop first. So kind of questions you're going to get into as a UX designer. What do we design for first? All right, it is late and surprisingly hot with all these cameras and uh, lights going. I am going to, let's make another video before we go to bed. All right, that is Figma mirror and testing your prototype on your phone. See you in a bit. All right, it is class project time. I want you to download the Figma mirror app from the Google Play or the App Store. I both named those wrong in the last, <laughs> the last video. Okay, so go in there and look for Figma Mirror. Uh, if that's not working for you for any reason, you can actually on your mobile phone, not on the desktop, go to figma.com slash mirror. It works mostly the same way. Okay, so log in with your account, uh, your Figma account and test your phone. And what I want you to do is just have a bit of a, bit critique of your own work. Okay, are the fonts large enough and legible enough? Are the colors 
easily contrasting. Okay, so I can actually see some of the text that is, you know, like over the top of these. I know it's a wireframe, so there's not much going on, but um, are these fonts for the description big enough? They don't all have to be 16 and massive, okay, but you know, there's some parts that do need to be bigger, okay, like uh, this one here, this like smaller part down here, does it have to be bigger? I don't know, I'm gonna test it on my phone. Also make sure that your buttons are all wired up, you know, go to prototype and just make sure they're all connected, okay, when you're testing, and also are they easily clickable? Are the buttons big enough? Okay, in the last one, I'm gonna go back to design mode. I had problems with these. They just didn't feel clickable. They're not, they weren't very nice. Just a bit awkward to click. So what I don't wanna do is, can you kind of see them there? I can see that like this one here just needs to be bigger. Like not the actual icon. I kind of like it that size. It's the framer on the outside. So like, unlike a group, remember a group, we can't deal with the frame independently. But because we're dealing with these sweet, cool frames with the little hash symbol, it means that, let's have a look and that this thing inside, okay, and this outside kind of wrapper, which is the frame, can be different sizes. Okay, we're gonna get a teeny tiny bit advanced here, but hey, let's do it. Um, so I don't wanna just grab the edge, okay, because what I wanna do is I wanna go inside of that group, okay, hello group, okay, or any of these things, go inside of them all, okay, and I wanna say, actually, I don't want you to scale, it's trying to match the size of the frame, which is cool, but actually I don't want that. I want you to say, actually, just stay in the center, don't scale, means when I grab my frame, which is this one on the outside, okay, and I grab it, look, hey, I can make it bigger. It stays in the middle, which is cool. Okay, but I can start making my buttons a whole lot more clickable without actually distorting the image or trying to make the icon bigger. Same with this one here. I can go inside of it. There's two vectors. I'm gonna shift click both of them. Don't scale, please, just stay in the center. Awesome. Go back to the framer on the outside. I'm gonna say, actually, just be a bit bigger. Nice. So there are, I haven't changed the size, I just made the clickable area easier to get to. And that's the only one I've actually rigged up, isn't it? <laughs> you get the idea. Okay, so that is it. Go and test your wireframe, okay, and check in your, where is it, class projects. I just want you to take it. Can you take a photo of your phone? Not everyone can. Um, if you've got another person's phone, take a photo of it. I just want to see it on the screen. Kind of proof that you did it. And a nice little, I don't know, cool graphic of your wire, first wireframe up on the screen. How do you feel now? Like, I remember when I first did my ever first wireframe, I still get that buzz of like, ooh, the thing I made, it's on a device, it's not my computer. And it's exciting, it's interacting, I'm clicking buttons, I feel like a professional. I don't know, is that you too? Anyway, uh, take a photo, if it doesn't work and you can't, you know, you've got no one else around to take a photo of your sweet new wireframe app, just take a screenshot from your phone and upload it to the, um, uh, assignments part of this website um all right that is it uh, i will see you in the next video hi everyone in this video we're going to look at animation in figma up until now we've been doing kind of more page transitions okay with the whole thing sliding out but now you ready for it wait for it oh, hey <laughs> cool huh uh, that is the arrow sliding in just the arrow rather than the whole thing. Okay, and to do that we need to learn something called smart animate and we need to add a delay on our pages. So let's jump in and I'll show you how to make it. Okay, so to animate in Figma, just like one element, we've just been animating like a transition between the entire thing. We just want this arrow to move in, like you saw at the beginning there. So what I wanna do is basically you have two of the same frame. So we're gonna have confirmation, this first one, we're going to duplicate it. So hold down the option key on a Mac, Oh, key on a PC, so we've got two of them. Okay, and on this first one, I want it to be off screen. Okay, kind of over here. Um, this one of the tips is when you are doing animation is I'm undoing that is just have a bit of space. Okay, so I'm going to move it over here just so I've got space for my arrow. So we're going to have this first confirmation where the arrow is going to be off. Okay, and the second one where it's going to be on. And to make the magic happen is we need to connect these two. Okay, so I'm going to click on this frame and I want to say prototype and I want to say go there. And when you go there, I want you to use Smart Animate. Okay, that's the one we ignored earlier. Basically, this works when there are objects of the same name on two, two separate frames, and it will animate them. Okay, it can see them on this first one, and it can see them on the second one, and it can see like, hey, they're in different positions. I'm smart, I'm gonna animate them. Okay, and I'm using the ease in and out back because it looked nice. <laughs> uh, so yeah, let's give that a go. 
um, confirmation. Let's hit preview and it's not going to work. I know it's not going to work. This is going to be the big thing that catches you out, especially with these kind of like slide in animations. So go click once. It faded in. Okay, what's happening is, is that this arrow is actually not part of this frame yet. Okay, or not part of this frame anymore. There was a time it was, look, I'm part of this frame. Okay, so have a look over here in my layers panel. Okay, I've got this line 13 on the confirmation page, but watch what happens. Look, watch it in the layers panel. If I drag it out, it's still part of it, still part of it, still part of it. At some stage it goes, boop. <laughs> Can you see? It, um, <laughs> I'm not sure where that noise came from, but there you go. It is line 13 and it is now like not in this frame or this frame, so it doesn't know what to do. So basically it says there's no arrow. Now there's an arrow, so that's why it just fades in. So that's really important to make sure that it is part of this frame. You can have it over here, okay? You just got to make sure it is inside the frame and you do it by dragging it in. Now we've got a little, a little tip is we've got two confirmations and that is pain. <laughs> it's hard to know which one is which in the layers panel. So I'm going to do confirmation A and confirmation B just to be helpful over here. And my OCD says A needs to be below B, A, B, there you go. So now confirmation A doesn't have my little line in there. So all I'm going to do is drag it in. There you go. It doesn't matter where it is. As long as it's in this frame, and there's one that corresponds in this frame. So there's line 13, we're out there, and there's one there. It's gonna work. All right, so let's go and give it a test. So I'm gonna use my back arrow once. Okay, I'm just using the arrow. You can click these down here if you want. Okay, um, I'm on page four. Click once. Hey, a little animation. Okay, so yeah, that's the basics of Smart Animate. As long as there's, there is something on both frames that has the same names and it does something different, it'll work. It could be even, uh, let's do a couple of things. One of the things with stuff off screen on confirmation A, we know it's there, like we can see it there, but we can't see it over here. So what we might do is turn the, remember one of the perks of a frame is under design with the frame selected, you could say clip contents. So it kind of clips it off. So you can actually see it and work on it. It's still part of the right um, layer order. Okay, nothing's changed except you can see it now while you're working but there are times you wanna kinda of turn it off so it's all tidy. Okay, so now I can see it, I can, we did animation of movement. It will actually smart animate anything. So let's say we wanna start it here, so it's still in the right, and uh, where were we? We're still in the right frame. It's still a different movement, but here we're gonna turn the opacity down to 10%, just so I can still see it. Okay, and let's go test that now. So back arrow, click once, woohoo, it fades in and does that. Okay, so there is a lot you can do. We're just gonna keep it simple for the moment. Let's talk about some of the quirks. Okay, so one of the quirks is that if you rename it, okay, so we've got line 13 and line 13. If you're like, oh, I'm gonna be very careful and good and rename at least one of my layers. Okay, because it's got a different name now, it's not gonna work. Let's go back, back arrow, click once. Just kind of like fudged it. Okay, so if you're gonna name one, that's fine. Just make sure you name the other one, arrow. Back one, click, woohoo. Okay, uh, what else do I wanna do? I don't like the fade in, so I'm gonna go back up to 100%. The other thing I want to do is, I'm doing it on click. Basically what I want to happen is I wanna to go to checkout page, okay, and when I click this, I want the arrow to start kind of like moving in, okay, automatically, because at the moment I gotta click it and bring it in. You'll also notice if I go back one, when I click on this, because of the transition between the checkout page and the confirmation page, because it does this back and forth, you actually see the arrow look. That's weird, huh? So we're gonna do a couple of things. When the checkout is open in prototype, I don't want it to do the crazy, what are we doing? We're gonna get it to do on tap, navigate to our confirmation, perfect. But I don't want to do the move in. I'm gonna to go to instant. And I'm gonna turn that clipping back on. So back to design. Remember we clipped it off before or turned it off so we could work on it? It's great while you're working, but if you start seeing weird things, you might have to turn the clip contents back on. So let's give that a go. I actually want this off screen. Make sure that it's inside confirmation A. Ready? So I'm gonna go back. Let's click this, instant. And I want it to automatically go across, not have to click somewhere and go across. So we're gonna introduce another kind of uh, transition between frames. Okay, so basically what I want to happen is when it gets to here, okay, 
and we go to prototype. Okay, the moment what happens is we say on tap navigate to this other confirmation B. I don't want it to be on tap. I just want to use this one that says after a delay. So I want it to get here. Okay, and then after a delay of however long, okay, I'm going to turn it down to one millisecond. You can't have zero for some reason. Okay, you have to have one millisecond, which is one thousandth of a second. So it's going to be instantaneous. It's going to get here and then automatically move to this. Okay, and it's going to still use our smart animation. So that's the only change. Let's give it a go. Let's go back to our purchase page. Give it a click. See, it got to there and then automatically moved on. If that's a bit confusing, let's change it to two seconds. So 2000 milliseconds. Okay, and let's go back. So we click this, it gets here, waits for two seconds, and then moves to the other one. And the smart animation moves it in. You with me? If you're not with me, don't worry. We've got a few more of these to do. It is a little bit weird, especially if you're from another kind of animation tool where you've got a timeline and keyframes and Figma does it. But if you're thinking, this seems a little bit clunky, it is. Don't tell anyone. Okay, it is Figma trying its best to be all things to all people. All right, so the rules are make sure that the names of the things you want to animate, like our arrow here, are the same on both frames. You have duplicates of the same frame. Don't move the stuff you don't want to, move the stuff you do want to animate. You need to make sure that the smart animate is transitioning between the two. That's what makes the magic happen. And the other big thing is that everything needs to be within the frames. Okay, what I mean by that is remember our little arrow over here, okay, can't be hanging out in no man's land. It actually has to be on this frame and this frame, even if it's out in the artboard, it needs to be kind of grouped together inside that frame. Those are the rules of animation in Figma. All right, that is it. I will see you in the next video. Okay, it's class project time, your first animation. Okay, so just get that arrow to move in. If you're kind of like mm, new to animation and you're like, man, this is gonna be tough. Um, just do the arrow that we did, okay, get it to work on yours. Change the arrow up a little bit, you know, <laughs> get exciting, get a like a line arrow <laughs> or a reversed arrow, do something a little bit different. Okay, but do that and then send me a screenshot. So just kind of like screenshot these two frames or three frames if you end up doing more. But yeah, if you're new to it, just do that. Nice simple one. We'll get into more animation later on. But if you are like a little bit keen and savvy and brave, okay, I'm happy for you to go a little bit further. Okay, so in here it says you might try something, keep it simple still, okay, don't get things to bounce in and bounce off stuff. Multiple keyframes like that is tricky in Figma. But maybe it comes in from the top, maybe using a ball, a square, a tick that comes in, something different, up to you. If you did want to do more than one kind of animation, you can have multiple frames that all kind of have delays and lead into each other. But again, that is for the people who, I don't know, at this stage, I come from an animation background-ish, so I'd be like tackling that. But if you're new, just do the simple arrow and we'll do more later on. The other thing is, is that we're just taking screenshots and uploading them as assignments. Okay, I'd love to see your animations, but in Figma, just so you know, there is no like built-in recording part when you get to here. Okay, it'd be great if there's a button that says record my stuff, check. It might be there now. Okay, but there's not at the moment. Okay, so I would love to see what your animations are. If you do know how to like record your screen like I do, okay, I'd love to see either a video uploaded to something like YouTube or Vimeo, okay, uh, that would be great, or an animated GIF, but it can get a little bit tricky if you haven't done it before. So screenshot is totally fine. All right, that is the class project. Do your first little animation, be excited, even if it is just a boring old arrow sliding in. All right, into the next video. Hi everyone, in this video we are going to be sharing our design with our client or one of our stakeholders. Okay, so we're gonna share it first of all with Doug. Who is Doug? Doug is fictional. Uh, I'm using Doug as a representative of a level of person you're gonna be sending it to. Doug is a simple creature. He hates computers and logging in and passwords. So, but we still need to get, you know, he's our client. I wanna get him this uh, prototype, okay, this wireframe at this stage, just to see if I'm on the right track. Keep him involved rather than surprising him at the end. So it's really easy to share stuff in Figma. So we're gonna use the share button along the top. Okay, click on that. And we're gonna start with a simple version. Okay, cause what I'm gonna do is just send Doug a link via email. That's all I'm gonna do. I'm gonna copy it. I'm gonna close it down. I'm gonna open up a browser and I'm gonna pretend to be Doug. Okay, so this is Doug. He, I emailed him a link. He clicked it in his email address. And this is what he says. 
Okay, the nice thing about it is that Doug doesn't have to sign up or get passwords or get a free trial or all of that jazz. It just works, which is really cool. Okay, and he can kind of move around. He can't do a whole lot without logging in. Okay, but he can look at it and he can't comment at this stage. We'll do that in the next part. Okay, but he can look at it and go, oh yeah, that's cool, I like that. Or hey, what's this going on? And give me some feedback at this early stage of my wireframe, just to make sure I'm on track. Um, the other thing you can do is this little play button still appears here. Okay, so we can click on this. You might have to tell him exactly where it is. And he can go through and actually prototype it without having to log in. He can see it, he can click on learn more. He can realize you can't get from learn more to the purchasing. Okay, so back to homepage. All right, so he can see all of this, which is cool. And one thing that might confuse Doug, which it does for some of my clients, is it's opened up a separate tab. You can't close this down and get back to it. You're like, you can click everything, but you actually just, it's got a separate tab that opens up when you hit this play button. See along the top there? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, where this gets even cooler, like this might freak Doug out, okay? It might freak you out. Okay, so he's working on this. What you'll notice is I'm gonna make Dig Doug go over this side. So pretend this side is Doug and this side is my regular old Figma. Okay, so let's put a gap in between. So this is him on his computer at his house and this is me on the, you know, this is me working like I did before. And what you'll notice is he can see my arrow. Figma is a really amazing uh, collaborative design tool. So it's probably for Doug, uh, he's not gonna appreciate that. <laughs> he's gonna be weirded out that I'm following him around with my little uh, hand. I can even see Doug, look, there is his hand. So if I move him over to, and click on this, anyway, <laughs> you can see each other, that's the point. Okay, and let's say Doug's like, oh man, it's good, but what is that green? I'm like, and I'm like, oh, quick, before Doug sees it, I can be, select all same color, go, and he's like, I hate green, man. Green's the worst color in the world. I'm like, ha ha, what about pink? He's like, I hate pink more. <laughs> what about red or orange? Okay, so what's happening is it's, this is live collaboration. So um, it is amazing when you're working with other designers and other creatives, because you're just doing something and you can all work on it together, okay? But at this stage, we're just working with Doug and yeah, he doesn't have to do anything else. He can just look, we don't have to be updating it in front of him but it's a cool little bonus extra. Now, let's bring Doug back. Come on, Doug. Okay, uh, if Doug wants to use commenting, okay, which is probably one of the really nice features, he can sign up free with either Google or sign up with his email address, and he'll be able to start commenting. Okay, so that's one thing that I might convince Doug to do, so you can actually use a little pin and actually start commenting on it. Let's show you a couple of other things before we do commenting. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to Figma. Okay, so forget about Doug, bye Doug. Okay, a couple of things that you can do as a designer, okay, is you can go into here, and when you do go to share, you can say, I want a link to a specific frame. So let's say that we all, the homepage is wrapped up, there's just problems with the um, product details page because there's no clickable button. Uh, let's do this terribly. Let's make that clickable, and we can go to the checkout. Okay, so what is it doing? Instant, that'll do. Okay, so what I can do now is I can select the frame first, and then go to share, and then that option will work. It'll say, when I send this link, it'll actually link to the specific frame, this one here, it'll start there, okay? If it's grayed out, it means you've got nothing selected, and I go to share, you can't tick anything. Okay, so that's one thing. Let me show you what commenting does. Okay, so let me upgrade Doug, wait there. Okay, so upgraded Doug, this is Doug now. Before he could only do very limited stuff, now with his free login, okay, he gets Probably a little bit too many details for oh, poor old Doug. You know, he's like, why can I see the CSS code? But the difference now is he's got commenting. So Doug over here is like, okay, I like this. Uh, you know, um, can't see my comment. So Doug's gonna write, why are we not using real images? <laughs> Signed, Doug. Doug, it's a wireframe, that's why. Okay, so he posts on his one. On my side, I can see Doug now, there he is. Okay, and I can start seeing comments coming through. Okay, and I can see it there, and I can see it's pinned, and I can see it's going there, and I can reply to Doug and say, Doug, I've told you a million times, this is just a wire frame for testing. Okay, send it off to Doug. I should put a smiley face in there. 
okay? And you can see we can have this collaboration between my client, okay, and me. They can pin stuff. All the client needs is a free login, or they can just do it by email. Don't have to log in at all. So commenting is great. There's a couple of things. And for me, on my side, let's forget about Doug now. Okay, let's go. Can you see up here, there's two Ds. I should have called him Fred or something, but there's two Dougs now. Okay, so there he is there. Uh, he's the yellow guy. You can have loads of them along the top here, okay, of different people looking at it. Lots of different clients, lots of different testers. Okay, I'm gonna go from my, I don't wanna be on comments anymore, because I can add comments myself. Okay, I wanna go back to my tools that I know and love. And actually I can go back to comments and I can say actually this one here, I can click on it and I can say, see it here, resolved. Okay, so it's one of those things that we are finished with now. I've kind of made the adjustments based on it, or at least I've replied to his and I'm kind of finished that and I can work as a designer through the different notes from my uh, client or tester or product manager. So commenting is pretty nice and fluid and in real time. All right, we'll wrap this video up. We'll do in the next one how to kind of share for editing. It's gonna introduce a different part of the Figma experience, which is Figma Teams. All right, I'll see you over there. Bye, Doug. Bye, Dan. I'm Dan. All right, in this video, we are going to take it another step along, okay? We send our file off to be shared with our client and that worked great, okay? But let's say we're gonna be sharing this with other colleagues, okay? You're working in a UX design team, okay? At a company and there's more than one of you working on documents. Okay, so I need to share this with somebody that can actually start working on the project and we kind of work together. To do that, we need to introduce something called Teams and team projects. So we got so far with just the drafts and using our sharing. So we look in here, kind of gave us an indication, right? If I wanna share, I can send it to say Doug and I want him to be an editor, but it says, hey, first to be an editor, you need to move it to a team project. I'm gonna click close. Up here it says it as well, do you wanna move this file? Okay, a lot of things are indicating needs to be in a team. So let's go and look at that the manual way. We can move it and it will automatically happen, but let's have a look the long way just so you can understand it better. So back at my little home house here, we've been working in drafts. You can have unlimited drafts, a bazillion drafts. Okay, eventually though, if you wanna be sharing it with other people and working on it, you need to move it into one of your projects. You also be named differently, depending on how you set up uh, Figma, okay? but this is called a team, okay? Think of a team as like a project, like Scott Headphones. As a freelance UX designer, you probably have about 20 teams or 30 teams, okay, for different companies. Some companies only need one team with lots of projects inside of it, okay? And the projects might be things like, hey, there's the mobile website, the desktop website, it might be some social media stuff we're working on, it might be some flyers that we've made, okay? Or the redesign of that web page, and then redesign again, lots of different projects. Okay, so you share the kind of company-wide team with the different people. Okay, so I can go to members and say, I wanna invite you, 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 and you to this team. And inside of this projects, we're gonna have desktop, mobile, January sale, all that sort of stuff. Anyway, those are what, that's the basic overview of what teams and the projects are. So let's go back to this. Okay, so we've been given, yours will be different. Okay, the name will be different but you've been given inside your team, there's already a team project. It's this thing here. You can view it that way or this way. It's the same thing, okay? We're gonna delete it for the moment and create our own. They've given you like a pre-made uh, team project with stuff in it. We can open it, have a look, okay? This is the default one for Figma at the moment, okay? And there's just a bunch of styles, okay? Lots of things going on in here, different assets, okay? It is, yeah. It's kind of useful. I find it's jumping in probably way too much for a newbie. So we're gonna close it down and you can keep it if you want. You don't have to. Back to home. I'm going to get rid of this project. Right click it, delete it. Sorry team project. I'm gonna create my own plus, create my own project. Okay, and this one is going to be the e-commerce it has to be lowercase e for some reason, <laughs> e-commerce website, okay. And let's create it. Now, all we need to do is this draft in here, the one we're working on called, mine's called Scott Ecom one I can just drag it into this project and that will unlock the editing, okay. And you're like, why, what's the difference between drafts and this kind of like team with a team project with a file inside that team project? 
this unlocks some of the features, okay, so that I can actually collaborate with that person. I've still got that file open, nothing's really changed except, you can see it's not in drafts anymore, it's in that project, and now when I go into share, I can do more, I can allow people to edit. So I can say, uh, okay, Doug, we don't really want to edit, but let's say Victoria, okay, um, Victoria is somebody I work with, another UX designer, I could send her email address in here and she could start editing this thing. So why do I show you all of this? Uh, because it pops up quite a bit and it's one of those breakpoints where you go from free to paid, okay, because let's have a look. Let me show you. So back at home, okay, remember drafts, you can have as many files in your drafts as you like, but if you want to share it with another collaborator, it has to be moved out to here, okay, and I've got a team, that team can only have one team project. Inside of that team project, you can only have three files. So that's where they kind of, you know, that's where you move from going, okay, I need to pay for this, okay, because it's great having one project, but I need two of them, e-commerce website and this other app that I'm building for them, or this other kind of subsection that I want to break apart rather than just jamming them in the same project. Okay, now in terms of the files, yeah, you're gonna need more than three pretty quickly. Now this changes, go to figma.com slash pricing and they will show you what you get. Okay, actually I'll bring it up here. This is what it looks like at the moment, it will change. Okay, it says free, you're allowed unlimited drafts, but you're only allowed one team project, okay, and you're only allowed three files within that project. There's a few other things as well, but this is where you might bump up to a paid, the paid product. There are ways around it, and a lot of people do. You're weirdly allowed at the moment uh, unlimited teams, okay? <laughs> so I could have a zillion different teams with one project and three files in it, and you can see how that works, and you can see how it might be a bit cumbersome as well. But it is pretty amazing what you get for free out of this Figma. Um, again, th these rules will change. Go and check figma.com slash pricing to see what is available and what's not. So to reiterate, okay, I've got this. I can share it. When it's in drafts, okay, I can move it back to drafts. I can say, you actually, I'm finished with this project now and I'm gonna be sneaky and move it back to drafts, okay, so they don't have to pay, okay? The trouble with it though is anybody that was an editor can't see it anymore, okay? It comes out of their Figma and goes into drafts and I have to kind of share it this way. Here we go, okay? Kind of like Doug, he can view it, he can comment on it, but he can't be a co-collaborator on it. So, pros and cons. There are a few other things that, that you know a paid version gives you that will throw in throughout the course, but that's one of the big ones. One team, one team project, and three files only. All right, that's it. I hope that helped. That really confused me at the beginning of like, this screen here. <laughs> uh, confused the heck out of me drafts, this thing, this thing. I can create more teams, what goes in here. So I hope that helps. I'm gonna leave mine back in drafts for the moment. So if you have dragged it out, put it back into drafts, you can just drag it, click hold, drag it from one to the other, and we'll resume our regular scheduled free version of Figma in the next video. All right, I'll see you there. All right, you made it to the end, well done. Uh, if you enjoyed it, like and subscribe, of course, and also remember that this is a short part of my longer course. It's not so short, right, but this is the first 29 videos of 111, so there's lots more to go here if you are interested. If you are, uh, there'll be a link up here in the cards in the corner, link in the description, or just Google Daniel Scott Figma Essentials and you will find me. Join me for the full course. Lots more exciting stuff to go. Um, yeah, that is it. I hope you're feeling more confident in Figma and maybe in UX in general. Um, if I don't see you at the full course, I'll see you around here on YouTube. Lots of pointing. But that is the end. Goodbye, everyone.